The stories start with a man, who stood face to face with a very strong dragon. Surprisingly, he defeated the dragon with just a touch. This courageous man didn't stop there. He went on to defeat more dragons. But he felt that it wasn't enough, and he needed to become even stronger. Next, we see a boy named Ragna in a battle against a dragon. Unfortunately, Ragna was no match for the dragon's strength. Thankfully, a girl named Leo came to his rescue and skillfully defeated the dragon. Leo advised Ragna to be cautious during battles, and Ragna thanked her for saving him. Leo felt that Ragna's way of thanking her wasn't quite right. Ragna then patted Leo on the head and expressed his gratitude. We learn that dragons were a long-existing evil bloodline and humanity's greatest enemy. There are two known ways to kill a dragon. One involved freezing their blood with a special aura emitted by silver weapons, and the other required burning their bodies in sunlight. Returning to the story, Leo successfully frees the dragon heart and declared that their quest was complete. They then returned to the city of Ranapra in the Lace Kingdom, where everyone recognized Leo by her facial scar. People gossips that she was a prodigy who had defeated around 50 dragons on her own. They visited a guild, and Ragna explained that those who earned rewards for defeating dragons were called dragon hunters. Among all the hunters in the city, Leo was the one who had hunted the most dragons. Ragna believed that she had already become a top-class dragon hunter at the age of 12, and he knew she would only become stronger. The two friends then shared a meal, and Leo mentioned her desire to eat some meat. Ragna assured her that they would have meat for dinner. Ragna knew that people in town had nicknames for Leo, like the girl loved by the silver sword or the ambitious dragon hunter. He believed these were just words from jealous folks, and in his eyes, Leo was a true hero. Ragna took some pictures of Leo, explaining that he just wanted to keep a record of her growth. Leo humorously pointed out that it might seem a bit strange if he was doing this for anyone else, and they both shared a laugh. Suddenly, a man approached Ragna and commented that meals earned by relying on the prodigy must taste incredibly delicious. Leo was curious about this stranger, who introduced himself as Sykes Charlie, and mentioned that his dragon hunting count was right below Leo's. Leo mentioned that she had never heard of Sykes, which made him feel sad. Sykes then wondered why a low-ranked person like him was teaming up with Leo, who was known as the prodigy. He thought he was just slowing her down and insulted Ragna by calling him a porter, someone who only carried Leo's stuff. This angered Leo, and she pinned Sykes down. Leo then told everyone that while they might want land, gold, and fame by defeating dragons, her only goal was to become stronger. She explained that this was the only thing on her mind when she first held a silver sword, which was why she became a hunter. She believed that among all creatures, dragons were the strongest, and that's why she wanted to hunt them all, even the dragon god himself. She asked if anyone wanted to join her in this quest and promised to share money, land, or fame with them. Nobody except Ragna agreed to join her on this journey, and Leo appreciated his loyalty. Leo suggested they return to their inn and get some sleep, but Ragna insisted that Leo should take a bath before bed. Leo found it troublesome and mentioned that she would only do if Ragna do all the scrubbing. Sykes couldn't believe that the two of them took baths together. The scene shifts to Leo sleeping peacefully. Meanwhile, Ragna goes out for practice and starts feeling like he doesn't have much talent as a dragon hunter. He believes that even if he trains for his whole life, He'll never come close to Leo's level. He worries that he might be eaten by a dragon before reaching her skill, but he's okay with that as long as he can be useful to Leo. While practicing, Ragna encounters the man he met earlier who warns him that he's going to lose everything. Then, Ragna witnesses a horrifying dream of a dragon attacking, and Leo getting killed. He wakes up, realizing it was just a nightmare. The story then takes us back to Leo, and Ragna returning to the guild after buying some meat. Leo questions why Ragna bought meat since they could order it at the guild cafeteria. Ragna explains that they don't put any vegetables in the food there. Leo confesses her dislike for vegetables, and Ragna offers to use the guild kitchen to cook something for Leo. She requests steak, and Ragna secretly plans to include some vegetables in the steak sauce. Next, we see Ragna putting Leo to bed after dinner. On February 23rd of the year 498, they go to the guild and notice there are no dragon slaying quests available. Sykes wonders how this is possible, and Leo and Ragna take a break outside the guild. Leo thinks that dragons are rare at the moment, and Ragna agrees, suggesting that Leo should consider cutting her hair since it's getting longer. The scene changes to Ragna cutting Leo's hair, and he can't help but remember the image of Leo dying in his dream. That night, Ragna has the same dream again. We then jump to February 26, and Ragna is busy with his training. He recalls the man's warning that he's going to lose everything. Later at the guild, hunters are talking about how dragons have been behaving strangely lately. They've all gathered in the east, and it's noted that Donapiro is located to the east of their city. Sykes mentions that Donapiro hasn't been attacked by dragons for the past 10 years. 
Leo adds that Donna Pira reminds her of the cake shop silver chick they have there, and she suggests that if they go to that city to hunt dragons, they should also visit that shop. However, Ragna seems distracted and isn't really paying attention to Leo. He's lost in thought, wondering about the meaning of his dream. He questions whether the man he saw in the dream was just his imagination or something else entirely. Leo interrupts his thoughts and tells him to stop daydreaming. She notices that Ragna has dark circles under his eyes, and his hands look worn out. She wonders if he's been training harder than usual these past few days, and if something happened. Ragna then asks if there's anything he can do to help her, mentioning that he doesn't want to merely take care of her. He's eager to figure out how he can genuinely be of assistance to her. Leo responds by saying that when she first met Ragna, she believed he could become as strong as her one day. But Ragna thinks it's impossible, believing that he has no natural talent. Leo acknowledges that she knows Ragna doesn't seem to have much talent when it comes to hunting dragons. She mentions that, as a prodigy herself, she can pretty much guarantee this. However, she also trusts her prodigy intuition, which tells her that someday, Ragna will become stronger. She doesn't know when or what will trigger it, but she's excited about that potential. Leo expresses her commitment to protect Ragna until that day comes. Ragna then recalls his past. His parents were tragically eaten by dragons when he was just three years old. The relatives who took him in also suffered the same fate. He was eventually bought by a noble family, but their mansion was burned down by dragons. Due to these events, Ragna was bullied and accused of somehow attracting the dragons. Ragnar remembers being attacked by dragons many times, but he always managed to survive. He felt like he had no place where he truly belonged. Leo enters Ragna's life and asks him if he'd like to hunt a dragon with her. She assures him that being linked to a dragon is not necessarily bad for a dragon hunter. Ragna hesitates, believing that his curse might affect her as well. Leo, however, disagrees, stating that it's not Ragna's fault that those people died. She tells him they perished because they were weak and that she's stronger than the dragons, so she won't die. Leo is determined to prove her strength to Ragna and invites him to come with her. Ragna accepts her offer, and together, they face a dragon. When they encounter the dragon, Ragna gets scared and starts doubting if this was a wise decision. But to his surprise, Leo easily defeats the dragon. This display of strength convinces Ragna that Leo is indeed strong and won't meet the same fate as the others. Leo asks Ragna if he still thinks he's cursed, and he responds that he doesn't. He explains that now that Leo is with him, all he wants is to be by her side until a dragon eventually kills him. He doesn't wish for anything else. However, he then experiences the dream of Leo dying once more. The scene shifts to February 27, and we learn that Donna Piro has fallen. Leo is puzzled about how this happened. Sykes explains that a swarm of dragons attacked the city as the sun went down, and there has been no communication since. The kingdom has issued an emergency quest to exterminate the dragon horde that attacked Donna Pira. Leo notices that Ragna has a strange look on his face. Ragna tells Leo they should run away but suddenly, everyone in the city feels tremors, and they see that the entire city is on fire. Ragna urges Leo to leave because he's worried she might die, but Leo reassures him that she won't. The city guards try to fight the dragons responsible for the fire but they are overpowered. However, some dragon hunters manage to stop the dragons from advancing further. Then, a man covered in blood appears and confronts the hunters. They wonder if he's okay, but to their shock, the man kills the hunters. It turns out he's not a man but a humanoid dragon. Ragna notices the humanoid dragon and fears that it's the one who will kill Leo. Sykes arrives to face the humanoid dragon and wonders why there's such a powerful dragon here. His team tries to attack it, but they are no match, and the dragon attempts to kill Sykes. Ragna tries to help by attacking from behind, but it doesn't seem to affect the superior dragon. The dragon uses a fire attack that sends Ragna flying into the river, and Leo instructs Sykes to rescue Ragna. She then faces off against the superior dragon herself. Leo was extremely angry that the dragon had hurt Ragna. She made a promise to herself that she would kill this dragon. Meanwhile, as Ragna sank deeper into the river, he also delved deeper into his vision. After losing Leo, he began a determined quest for revenge, vowing to hunt down every last dragon until they were extinct. He fought fiercely, became more powerful, and pushed his training to the maximum. However, no matter how much he fought and trained, it never seemed enough. He gained new companions during battles, but unfortunately, he lost them too. Despite a life filled with loss, he kept fighting, pushing himself to the limit and beyond. In his vision, the man from before appeared again, and Ragnar realized this was his future self. Future Ragna was disgusted with present Ragna for idolizing a little girl as his hero and relying on her. He believed that if Leo truly mattered to him, he should have become stronger than everyone else to protect her. 
Future Ragna was furious because, now being incredibly strong, he could stand against dragon monarchs and protect everything he lost. But there was nothing left for him to protect. He had learned that being strong without anyone to protect was pointless. Ragna asked his future self to give him that power, and his future self agreed. He stabbed Ragna with a sword, and Ragna's body filled with power. Back in the ongoing fight, the man praised Leo for her determination. Leo wondered if he was the dragon god, but he became furious at the comparison. He introduced himself as Grimwell, the tenth seed of the blood of the wing, the lowest rank among the superior dragons according to what humans called them. Grimwell then explained that their city and kingdom were going to be destroyed. The dragon god enjoyed the offerings humans made, particularly the confections from a shop in Dona Peru. However, a few days ago, the shop was robbed and went out of business. The dragon god was sad, so he ordered his men to destroy the kingdom in response. Grimwalt takes pleasure in the fact that the fate of human nations can be decided by their god on a mere whim. He believes humans are foolish for thinking this was a real battle, and explains that the dragon army didn't even take them seriously. He proudly declares that dragon hunters pose no threat to their bloodline. He tells Leo that they are insignificant, and prepares for her impending demise. However, something suddenly interrupts Grimwald. At first, he wonders if it's an illusion, but he quickly realizes that something is approaching. Meanwhile, Ragna discard his old armor, and the people around him are speechless as the air becomes shrouded in fog, and the dragons start freezing. Ragna reflects on how, after deciding to exterminate dragons, he relentlessly pursued that goal. He faced countless near-death experiences, but managed to survive each time. He fought tirelessly for ten years, gradually feeling a connection between himself and his silver sword. It was a strange but empowering experience that didn't hinder his dragon hunting. After five years, he was entirely fused with his silver sword, turning his body into a weapon radiating silvery. Three years later, he developed a technique to enhance his body's silvery. Four years after that, he learned how to control silvery at will. After an additional ten years, he surpassed the limits of human capability and mastered the ultimate battle technique, the pinnacle of dragon annihilation, the Silverine battle arts. Ragna has gained incredible power, and just his presence can freeze dragons. He confronts Grimwald, who is stunned as he begins to freeze. Grimwald recognizes the feeling, the same sensation he has towards the dragon monarchs, the leaders chosen by their god. It's a mix of terror and awe toward beings with ultimate power. Grimwalt refuses to fear a human and reveals his true form, the form where his ultimate power is unleashed. Unfortunately for him, Ragna doesn't care and turns Grimwalt into a giant ice statue with a single touch. Then, with a flick of his finger, Ragna destroys Grimwalt. Leo calls out to Ragna, and he can't contain his emotions at seeing her again. Leo is still alive, and she assumes that Ragna must have worked really hard to become so strong. However, Ragna explains that he did, and the one who did all the hard work isn't there anymore. Ragna knows his life story and how much he missed Leo. Leo is grateful and thanks Ragna. Elsewhere, a woman laughs at future Ragna for dying while standing up. She had warned him that there was a price to be paid. She explains that his past self, the one taking on that burden, won't live long either. However, she notices that future Ragna has a sentimental look on his face, a rare sight without his usual frown. She points out that everything now depends on the past, and their hopes of creating a world without dragons rely entirely on their past selves. We then learn that not everything is good in the world. On that day, seven of Les's cities were attacked, and six of them fell, including the capital. On the very same day, the Reaper of Dragonkind was born. The next day, they notice that all the dragons have disappeared, and the fires have gone out. However, half of the city has been destroyed, and many people have been hurt. Ragna is relieved to see that Leo is still alive. Sykes arrives and reminds them to be good guests in his home since their house was burned down. Ragna then suggests that it's best for them to leave the country. The dragon god demanded that their kingdom be destroyed, and since dragons follow their god's orders strictly, they won't chase them if they cross the border. Luckily, their city is near the border, and Ragna thinks they should move quickly. However, Sykes interrupts him. He points out that the Ragna he knows has no talent, skills, or much intelligence. He calls him a parasitic nobody, and can't understand what happened the night before. He demands an answer but is surprised when Ragna falls asleep. Leo explains that Ragna's newfound power is likely the result of intense training when she wasn't watching. However, she realizes that it's draining him and making him unstable. She believes that he still needs her. While Ragna sleeps, Leo reassures him that she is still there. Suddenly, the ground begins to shake, and everyone is shocked to see that the city seems to be under attack by the forest itself. Scene changes and we see it's a powerful opponent, and it's the same woman from the future. She's ready and asks Ragna to come forward so that their paths can finally cross. 
Scene changes and in the forest, a powerful dragon named Temruagtaf is responsible for the attack. He has a chef who brings him food, and they nervously wait to see his reaction. Luckily, the dragon is delighted by the dish, and the chef is relieved. However, Temruagtaf mentions that it's still not as good as human meat, so he bites down on the man. He then grabs two women and eats them as well. He turns his attention to the last girl, saying that since their god has commanded them, he's free to eat everyone in the country. He grab her and open his pig mouth with cactus to eat her. Meanwhile, Sykes is running through the kingdom, cutting through tree roots. He notices that the roots freeze, realizing that a dragon is responsible for the attack. Leo also tries to cut down the roots but finds there are too many of them. She sees that Ragna has been captured and rushes to save him. Some tree roots are about to stab her, but Ragna suddenly awakens and freezes all the roots in the area. He senses the presence of the dragon and quickly heads toward it. Leo tries to keep up but is left behind. Ragna arrives at the dragon's lair and defeats it with a kick. He realizes that he's cursed and has seen a future where everyone close to him is killed by dragons. He wonders how to avoid losing everyone and decides that he must eliminate all the dragons. He's determined to succeed, even though his future self couldn't do it. At that moment, the girl beside him wonders if he's okay, and Ragna is surprised to see her. He recognizes her as Crimson, but quickly realizes her name is Eliza, a 14-year-old boy from a farming village that was attacked by dragons. He knows that her story is just a cover. Ragnar reveals that he has met her future self, but the girl, who now says her name is Elise, claims not to know what he's talking about. Ragnar insists that she is actually Crimson, the former dragon monarch of the Winged Bloodline, but she was branded a traitor after attempting to kill the dragon god. He explains that she was the one who linked the future with the present, allowing Ragnar's future self to give him his power. While he's not entirely sure why, he knows her goal is to wipe out all dragons, including herself. Ragna believes they should work together to achieve the goals set by their future selves. Elise is about to take his hand, but she suddenly slaps him, insulted that he called her a man and a dragon. Leo catches up to them, wondering if the fight is already over, but the dragon suddenly reappears. It prepares to devour them, but Ragna throws an orb as he escapes with Leo. It turns out to be a bomb, and the dragon explodes into ice. Leo is amazed by how strong he has become. Ragna then asks her for a favor, requesting that she help lead the remaining people across the border. He plans to stay behind. Leo refuses to leave him and insists on sticking together. Ragna warns her that it will be dangerous if she stays, but she believes it's a normal part of being a dragon hunter. However, he tells her that she's too weak and will die if she stays with him. This devastates Leo, and she even swings her sword at him, but he stops it with a single finger and knocks her out. When Leo wakes up, she finds herself being carried by Sykes, and they are with others heading to the border. In a flashback, Leo had asked Ragna what kind of dream he had. He replied that he was happy as long as he could be with her, which she couldn't understand why he would leave her. Elise wonders if Ragna is truly okay leaving Leo, but he explains that he can only be with people he doesn't care about or people who won't die. Elise is ready to leave, but Ragna insists that she join him. She gets annoyed and says she is not crimson. She points out that if she were a dragon, she couldn't be out in the sunlight. Ragna explains that her powers are sealed, but it allows her to walk in the sun. Elise argues that she's clearly a girl, but Ragna knows she can freely change her age and gender. Frustrated, Elise walks away, but Ragna catches up, offering to take care of her like he used to care for Leo. She thinks he's weird and turns him down. Suddenly, Ragna collapses with a high fever. In a flashback, we see future Ragna meeting Crimson who introduces herself as a dragon monarch. Ragna instantly kills her, but she keeps reappearing, suggesting they join forces. Back in the present, Ragna wakes up, and Elise took care of him. She examined his body while he was unconscious, finding the silverine he can generate and his immense potential. She gets excited about the idea of killing dragons with him. They notice a horde of dragons flying toward the border. Elise thinks they're going after the people who are leaving the town. Ragna grabs her, and they rush after the dragons. Although Ragna is prepared to take orders from her, she insists she isn't crimson but tells him to kill all the dragon. Ragna kicks a dragon out of the sky and uses his silverine technique to create multiple swords, freezing a dragon instantly. Belize catches one of the swords and realizes its potential. She thinks about equipping an entire army with these swords to kill superior dragons. She finally sees Ragna's value. She then vomits some strange liquid and turned out it was a slime that devoured the flesh of dragons. Elise transforms and reveals that she truly is crimson. Ragna is happy to see this form, but she tells him she will only work with him if he drinks her poison. The poison takes effect if he rebels against her because his power is dangerous for her as well, but Ragna drinks it without hesitation. She asks him why he want to kill all the dragon. 
Ragnar replied that he want to per basically he want to eliminate it his enemy before they can eliminate it. She doesn't think he's a hero but sees promise in him as a tool. She plans to use him to defeat the six dragon monarchs and the dragon god. After everything is settled, she intends for Ragnar to finish her. She calls this the beginning of their story. The story continues with a city under attack by dragons. One of these dragon monarchs has the power to control the wind. He uses this power to hold girls in midair and cuts their bodies with the wind, causing them pain. This dragon is a bit crazy because he talks to the wind, and he's curious about why humans can endure these cuts and remain alive. He believes this torture will make the wind stronger and create a sense of unity. One of the girls pleads for help, which piques the dragon's interest. He thinks it would be exciting if someone came to their rescue because he's finding the whole situation rather boring. Meanwhile, Crimson is ready to put his plan into action. He aims to start a massive battle that will change the world's fate and wipe out the dragons. However, his plans are interrupted by a voice. It's a slime that used to be inside Crimson's stomach. The slime transforms into a child and expresses dissatisfaction with Ragna's behavior towards Crimson. Ragna is initially confused but greets the slime as if they've met before, which infuriates the slime. The child slime claims to be Crimson's number one servant and insists on being called Mr. Slime. Crimson lands on the slime's head, pleased that they seem to be getting along. Crimson is eager to know more about the future, but Ragna tells him they've already lost. This surprises Crimson. He asks Ragna how many dragon monarchs they've managed to defeat and inquires about world magic, the Great Crusade, and Ragna's own fate. Ragna is puzzled by these questions, and Crimson's trust in him begins to waver. Ragna explains that he has vague memory and needs specific triggers to recall them. He only remembered Crimson when he saw his face. Crimson realizes that Ragna's memory is selective, which is convenient for Ragna but frustrating for him. Despite his doubts, Ragna asks for Crimson's trust, but Crimson questions Ragna's power, which was given to him by his future self. Ragna reassures him that his power resides in his body, not his mind. They then hop into a truck and continue their journey. Meanwhile, we see some folks who manage to escape from danger, and they're being protected by a group of hunters. The leader of the hunter group is trying to boost the spirits of his team, telling them to stay strong. The group listens, but they notice that regular folks are running away from the area, only to fall victim to the dragons nearby. This situation leaves the leader wondering what's going on. A massive dragon is roaring at them, and it seems like all hope is lost. Then, out of nowhere, a truck shows up performs a fancy Tokyo Drift maneuver, and a guy named Ragna jumps out. He quickly takes down two dragons and faces the rest. The group leader can't believe his eyes when he witnesses Ragna's incredible skills. Crimson, who is also in the truck, mentions that he's interested in Ragna's impressive battle ability, which he calls Silverine Battle Arts. He expresses his desire to see these skills in action against the dragons. Ragna agrees, but Crimson interrupts him and explains that Ragna won't be the one using these skills. Instead, it's a group of dragon hunters who will employ them. He points to the group of hunters and survivors. Ragna looks at them and sees the group leader trying to comfort a young child, assuring her of safety. Crimson seizes this opportunity and reassures everyone that they've taken care of all the nearby dragons. He introduces Ragna as the Reaper, a master dragon hunter who has defeated many powerful dragons. This announcement leaves everyone, including Ragna, puzzled. Crimson goes on to introduce himself as Ragna's companion and a mage. This impresses the crowd. In this world, not many people can use magic, and most magic users are powerful dragons. Crimson believes he can deceive everyone because only a small percentage of people have ever witnessed magic. The group leader questions if the water thing consuming the dragon is magic, to which Crimson confidently responds with a yes. When asked why the water thing can turn into a person, Crimson simply says, it's magic. The slime, annoyed by these falsehoods, tries to insult the group. But Crimson acts quickly, soothing the slime and explaining that it's a magical pet. Everyone buys into this lie, despite hearing the slime talk, and they even start praising the wonders of magic. Crimson skillfully manipulates the situation, and everyone begins to chant that magic is amazing, merely echoing his words. In essence, he has manipulated them into believing his story and turned them into his unwitting followers. The group leader, Michael, approaches Crimson and introduces himself. He kneels down and implores both Crimson and Ragna to help them take down a powerful dragon. Crimson is intrigued, and Michael continues to explain their situation. They fled from Tor City when it was attacked by a massive tornado, and the dragon they want to defeat is none other than the third seed of the Tempest Cell, Descent's Twa. Michael shares that Desaz likes to hide within the wind, and he knows this because he's a mage. This revelation angers Ragna, who decides to walk away, but Crimson stops him by grabbing his shoulder. He inquires where Ragna is headed 
to which Ragnar responds that he'll hunt to Saz. Crimson, however, disagrees, giving Ragnar a small pat on the back that makes him stumble forward. This leaves Michael puzzled. Crimson proceeds to ask Ragna if he knows why he can't get up, and since Ragna cannot answer, Crimson explains that Ragna's power has removed all limits from his mind. However, his body remains the same, and it's physically unable to handle his current power. Consequently, all his muscle fibers are damaged, and he won't be able to move for three days. Ragna is frustrated, but Crimson smiles cunningly, almost like a villain, and tells him to leave the task to him. As you might have guessed, Crimson has a plan that involves the others. He tries to explain the situation to everyone, suggesting that Ragna is slightly injured. This makes everyone concerned, and they ask if Crimson can take on Desaz instead. They even offer to pay him and promise to give him their weapons as compensation. However, Crimson interprets this as them giving up on dragon hunting, and he declines once more. He questions why they're so fixated on Desaz when they're not in immediate danger and they don't provide a clear answer. Crimson then goes on to explain that they feel guilty about running away from Desaz. He points out that Desaz's attack range is wide, and he's swift, so they had to flee without thinking about the consequences. But now, they're plagued by guilt because they ignored those who asked for help. Michael starts to recall these distressing images in his mind, intensifying his feelings of guilt. He begins to sink into despair, and Crimson continues with his manipulative tactics. Crimson asserts that Michael only protected this last group because he didn't want to blame himself for not saving others. Michael eventually falls to his knees, admitting the truth. He claims he couldn't do anything because he's just a weak hunter, unable even to face a superior dragon. Crimson doesn't stop there. He keeps pushing Michael until he declares that he would protect everyone if he had the power of either Crimson or Ragna. Crimson had been waiting for this moment, and he presents Michael with a sword, claiming that it holds the power Michael desires. With this sword, he can take on dragons. However, Crimson can't guarantee their safety. Michael eagerly accepts the sword, which excites Crimson. He then leads them to the old city of Tor, and they stop at a demolished building with just a single door. Using a magical key, Crimson opens the door, and the hunters step inside, utterly astonished. It's a room filled with guns, and they are bewildered. Crimson explains that it's all thanks to magic. As you might have guessed, magic is truly amazing. The hunters select some weapons, impressed by their quality. Crimson clarifies that these guns are far more powerful than the ones they use in their country. But the most crucial part is the bullets. It turns out that Crimson is compelling Ragna, who is currently immobile, to infuse his power into these bullets. The hunters practice their aim, which makes Crimson grin like a madman. Ragna comments on his twisted smile, but Crimson questions if he's against it. Ragna explains that he isn't because he knows Crimson will ensure the hunters can win. However, Crimson senses that Ragna is a bit upset. Ragna clarifies that he can't move, but more importantly, he doesn't want to be called the Reaper or become a spectacle. He reveals that he doesn't want people around him because they might die. Crimson recalls his previous words about only staying beside people whose deaths won't affect him or people who cannot die. He accuses Ragna of abandoning Leo. Ragna tries to deny it, but Crimson explains that's probably how Leo felt. Ragna says that it's not Crimson's concern, but this triggers a reaction from the dragon. Crimson argues that Leo is Ragna's motivation, but what if Leo were to get killed? He claims that Ragna will annihilate every dragon and won't quit until it's done. Since they're working together, Crimson now sees Leo as an important part of their mission. Ragna explains that keeping Leo close to him allows him to protect her, but he's still afraid of losing her again right before his eyes. Crimson consoles him, revealing that he now understands Ragna a bit more and suggests imprisoning Leo. He explains they can use her magic storage spaces to put Leo in a comatose state, keeping her safe while they deal with the dragons. She won't disturb them or be in danger, and he can look after her. Ragna attempts to move his body to punch Crimson, but he's too slow. Crimson gets up and taunts Ragna by kicking him. He asks Ragna what's bothering him and why he doesn't listen. Ragna simply responds that Crimson is acting like a jerk. Crimson boasts that being a jerk is his best quality, and he becomes quite agitated. He admits that he's always disliked Ragna's attitude, especially when Ragna acted like he knew everything about Crimson. Crimson believes Ragna doesn't know anything about him and kicks his face. Then he starts walking away, saying that he'll defeat Desaz. While leaving, he also complains about Ragna constantly blaming his misfortunes on a curse. He puts a bullet in his mouth, leading to a tense situation. The slime, which has been scouting Desaz's movements, returns and gives a report. It transforms to show the state of the city and what Desaz is doing to the girls. Crimson realizes that Desaz was ordered to stay in that town and is spending time there. He believes the girls need to hold on as long as possible for his plan. 
but he decides not to inform the hunters or Ragna about the survivors. He intends to manipulate them instead. Crimson starts working on his plan and shares it with everyone, and they become enthusiastic and leave. A few minutes later, DeSaz is taken aback because he didn't expect someone to appear. He tries to welcome them, but Crimson uses a megaphone to speak instead. He introduces the group as dragon hunters and begins talking about the dragon bloodline, calling DeSaz a pathetic loser. DeSaz is quite annoyed and doesn't understand how a human can talk about something they don't know. He continues to grumble to himself until his brain begins working again. He cannot forgive someone who insults the dragon bloodline, especially the dragon god. Meanwhile, Crimson is just driving away, repeatedly calling DeSaz a pathetic loser. The story continues with Michael feeling uneasy. He remembers the preparations they made over the past few days and how they felt so confident, with no doubts or fears. But now, there's a massive tornado in front of them, and Michael wonders if a group of amateur dragon hunters like them can take down this monstrous threat. Despite his doubts, he steals himself and encourages his crew not to panic. He orders them to slay the ferocious dragon known as Desaz Trois, swearing that he won't let it escape. Michael believes this is what the wind is guiding him to do. Meanwhile, Crimson is worried as he observes the Tempest Cells tornado, realizing it's moving twice as fast as their car's top speed. Trying to escape would lead to their demise as they'd be torn apart. Desaz Twa notices Crimson and the others heading towards the sun and thinks that the sunlight won't affect him much given his strong defensive and regenerative powers. However, it will still weaken him to some extent. Michael takes action and fires bullets at the tornado, causing parts of it to freeze. Crimson clarifies a common misconception among dragon hunters. Silver bullets don't freeze the blood of dragons, but rather the magic within their blood. When this magic interacts with the wind controlled by magic, freezing occurs. Desaz Twa questions if they are using silver bullets and wonders about the purpose behind these attacks. Crimson suspects that Desaz Twa is pondering their tactics. He mentions that these bullets are not silver but are filled with a substance called Ragnus Silvery. However, Desaz Twa still doubts the significance of these attacks, thinking that freezing the surface with such minor attacks won't break his connection with the wind. Crimson reveals that they haven't unleashed their ultimate weapon yet, and instructs the dragon hunters to fire the silver bullets infused with Ragnus Silvery. This manages to freeze a substantial part of the tornado. The power difference between the bullets significantly affects Desaz Twa, making him realize that his bond with the wind is weakening. Crimson urges the dragon hunters to keep firing. In response, Desaz Twa increases the speed of his tornado and expresses his disdain for the humans. He belittles their strength, comparing them to lower creatures, and vows to kill them all, determined not to let anyone escape. Crimson leads the way onto a bridge, and as they cross it, the enormous tornado starts to disappear. Ragna covers the bridge with his silverine energy. The slime then catches Desaz Twa and hurls him onto a silver spear held by the dragon hunters. Desaz Twa begins to freeze, worried that his heart is injured, which would cut off his blood source and stop his magic flow. With the sun rising, Desaz Twa starts to burn. The slime tells the dragon hunters to finish him off. Desaz Twa uses his magic to lift the ground and free himself from the humans. He removes the spear from his chest, believing that the dragon hunters are powerless against him. However, Crimson takes action and runs him over with their truck, while the dragon hunters continue to shoot at him. Crimson explains that Desaz Twa is no easy opponent. He can summon up to eight tornadoes simultaneously when he transforms into his dragon form. Crimson tells Ragna that their plan would have failed if Desaz Twa had been able to do that. He states that their success came because Desaz Twa couldn't imagine losing. Crimson provoked his desire to kill him. But Desaz Twa didn't unleash his full power due to pride and arrogance, which is the third major weakness of dragon, in addition to sunlight and silvery. Crimson developed high-quality dragon hunting weapons to exploit this weakness, and Ragna should be thankful to the Tempest Cell for allowing him to showcase his incredible potential. Ragna recalls a conversation from the previous day when Crimson assured him that choosing him was the right decision. Ragna realizes that Crimson wasn't treating this as a battle, he was experimenting. Ragna admires Crimson's deep knowledge of dragon hunting and his ability to foresee the future. He's once again reminded of how amazing Crimson is, and they're on a mission to eliminate dragons. Ultimately, Ragna envisions a future where he'll even hunt Crimson. The scene shifts to the dragon hunters embarking on their new journey. They inquire with Crimson if he's comfortable providing them with weapons and vehicles. Crimson assures them it's not a problem and hopes they can safely leave the country. Slime also wishes them luck. Crimson uses his magic to make the humans forget about him. Michael acknowledges that they owe their survival and their quest for vengeance to Ragna. However, Ragna humbly reminds them that they all played a part by standing up to the dragon. 
Michael considers it a triumph for all dragon hunters, and he departs with his crew and the survivors he was guiding. Crimson then takes out a radio, and someone from the Royal Army of Lace makes an announcement. They inform the public about a large-scale dragon attack near the border. All citizens are urged to follow the army's directive and evacuate to the capital, emphasizing that the royal capital is safe. They warn against approaching the border under any circumstance. Ragna suspects it might be a trap, and Crimson agrees. They decide to head to the capital. The story then takes us back in time by five days. The king in the capital receives news of Don Eru's destruction. He asks the messenger which country attacked the city. The messenger reveals that it was dragons, not an invading country. After sunset, a lightning storm reduced the city to ashes, and almost all the armed forces there were wiped out. Subsequently, a horde of dragons descended upon the city, and all communications ceased. The king instructs the messenger to assemble a unit from troops stationed in Ronabur and Tortier to provide aid. He also orders the recruitment of dragon hunters as emergency troops, emphasizing not to engage with superior dragons. The messenger understands and departs. An old man recalls a similar incident from 20 years ago when Garns attacked Don Apiru. Dragons suddenly appeared, delivering devastating lightning strikes to Garns' army. The king reflects that this made him believe that the local dragons weren't keen on fighting, and he wonders what might have provoked their wrath. He feels confident that the capital is secure because it's protected by a barrier. The king notices something unusual in the throne room, it's too quiet. Suddenly, an angelic-looking girl named Ultima descends into the room. She apologizes for her abrupt arrival and explains that she's been granted the title of monarch by their god. She's the first seed of the Bloodwing, and her name is Ultima. The king recognizes her as the angel-winged demon. Ultima feels that the title of monarch is a bit too grand for her. The king wonders how she managed to enter the barrier protecting the kingdom. Ultima clarifies that the barrier, known as the solar safeguard created by the Solarium, emits sunlight accumulated during the day to ward off dragons. She reassures the king that the barrier is still intact, even though she's enduring the heat it generates. The king realizes there's no record of a dragon monarch openly participating in the ongoing conflict between humans and dragons. Ultima tells him not to worry, as his vassals are safe. She explains that she manipulated time to freeze the world temporarily, concealing her presence, as it would be problematic for a dragon monarch to be seen in the capital. Ultima's visit piques the king's curiosity, and he questions the purpose of her arrival. Ultima apologizes and presents the head of the dragon responsible for destroying Don Apiru. She clarifies that she didn't intend to attack the city, but the dragon acted swiftly, forcing her to punish him and bring his head as an apology. The king accepts her apology but is puzzled by her actions. He considers the possibility of attacking Ultima, given that he can still move and the barrier is active. However, he realizes that this would lead to an all-out war with the Bloodwing, resulting in the destruction of his kingdom. Thus, he chooses not to attack. Ultima's explanation confuses the king further. She had previously mentioned not intending to attack Don Apiru, but now she claims that her god decreed the destruction of Lace. Ultima reveals that she's been secretly preparing for the annihilation of the country. She believes that chaos is inevitable now that one city has been destroyed. To prevent people from fleeing, she has ordered attacks on cities near the border, ensuring that no one escapes. The king pleads with Ultima to stop these attacks and questions if she really wants to go to war with his kingdom. Ultima believes it will be a one-sided bloodbath, implying that she has no intention of sparing his people. The king realizes he's left with only one option, to attack Ultimatia with the barrier. However, the old man we mentioned before transforms into a dragon and stops the king. A person named Nebulum shields Ultimatia from the falling debris, and she expresses her gratitude to him. The old man, named Borgias, seems a bit miffed that she didn't thank him, but Ultimatia clarifies that she wanted him to ensure the king's safety. Borgias confirms that the king is indeed alive. Ultimatia uses her magic to turn back time to the moment when the king was unharmed. She apologizes for the confusion, and the king is left wondering if he had just died moments ago. Ultimatia clarifies that he did, leaving the king astounded. He starts to think that maybe Ultimatia is some kind of god, but she modestly asserts that she's just a humble servant. With their predicament seeming unsolvable, Ultimatia asks the king for his support. She proposes that they work together to ensure that as many people as possible pass away without suffering. The king agrees to her plan. The story continues with the Lee's royal army evacuating citizens, because there's a big dragon attack happening near the city's border. The king is told that too many refugees are coming to the capital, but he says to let them all in and not worry about the future. There's a head on a sword that Ultimatia kept, and it's somehow still alive. It talks about how people, even if they're proud or capable, look lifeless after they die because their spirit is gone. Ultimatia arrives and is surprised that the head hasn't burned up yet. 
She tells the head about their evil plan, which is already in motion. In 10 days, they'll give all the people in the capital a peaceful death, which is what Ultimatia wants. She punishes the guy for interrupting her and tells him that the ninth seed of the dragons, Dornia, was defeated by the second princess of the kingdom, Starly Elites. So she sent the fifth and sixth seats, Terectra and Ulto Zoro, after her. The guy asks what she wants him to do, and she says that the third and eighth seats, Disaz Twa and Temriwagta, as well as the tenth seat, Grimwell, have disappeared. These are the three dragons defeated by Ragna. The guy with only a head thinks it might be Solarians or dragons from a different bloodline. But Ultimatia says the Elder told her it's an entirely unknown threat. The guy gets excited about this information, and Ultimatia punishes him again for his reckless actions that caused his head to be removed. He asks her to give him his heart back, promising not to mess around. She agrees but says his punishment is only temporarily suspended. She tells him to take care of the unknown threat, and we learn that this dangerous-looking guy is the second seat, Walt Camulet with lightning claws. He asks for a kiss as a reward if he succeeds, but Ultimatia refuses and gives him a good punch, saying he never learns his lesson. The guy says he loves making Ultimatia mad and speeds away like lightning. We see what happened in Ragna's future. He got into this terrible situation by chasing the blood of the wing, and he lost. Ragna is surrounded by all 12 seated drivagons of the winged monarch, and he's angry with himself for surviving without achieving anything while all other humans have perished. He tries to shout, but he's kicked by the seventh seat dragon, Borgias. Borgias tells Ragna to be quiet because they're in front of the winged monarch. Then, he asks all the dragons to share their opinions about what they should do with Ragna. The twelfth seat dragon, Chanteras, says they have no choice but to end Ragna's life. All the dragons are evil and want to end his life, the only dispute is how to do it. Some want to eat him, others want to use him for experiments, and a few don't care. One strangely wants to end his life with the least pain. Ragna is filled with rage as his enemies stand in front of him, but he can't move. In this future, Leo died, and Ragna wishes he had died instead. He condemns his weakness but realizes that this time, even his life won't be spared. He's tired of enduring and wonders if he can finally find peace as they plan to take his life. Unfortunately for Ragna, Walt Kamui can sense that Ragna is feeling relieved at the thought of dying. Walt Kamui is a psychopath and decides they shouldn't kill him. He wants Ragna to live in a living nightmare. Some others disagree, but Walt Kamui insists he won't show mercy to anyone. Kami asks if anyone has an issue with it, and Ultimatia speaks up by destroying Walt Kamui. Ultimatia doesn't like people who disrupt harmony in the group and tells Walt Kamui to be quiet. She asks everyone to consider her opinion and shockingly reveals that she wants to welcome Ragna into their bloodline. Walt Kamui disagrees, and Ultimatia puts a blade through his head. She introduces herself to Ragna as a progenitor of the blood of the wing. She notices that his sword is similar to those used by dragon hunters in a certain kingdom, which she thought was beautiful but burned to the ground. Ultimatia thought she wiped out every living creature from that country, but now she realizes Ragna is the lone survivor. She believes it must be God's will for him to continue living. Ultimatia is really happy that Ragna survived, and the sixth seat, Ulto Zora, explains what she means by welcoming him into their bloodline. It means she wants to turn Ragna into a dragon. Grimwald explains that inferior dragons are just beasts born from the blood of superior dragons, while superior dragons like them can take on human form. They were all given blood by their progenitor, and used to be humans. Ragna is shocked by all this, and he's told he should be happy because he's getting the gift of evolving into a life form much higher than humans. But Ragna refuses because he's filled with rage, especially for the lives they've taken, like his friend Leo's. He angrily tells them to end his life, but they explain that once he becomes a dragon, his hatred will fade away. Ultimatia wants to save him from his living nightmare, and is about to start the transformation by thrusting her blood blade into his heart. Ragna begs her to stop, but she encourages him not to worry. She assures him that he'll still be himself, only his way of seeing the world will change. She plunges the sword into him, and the transformation begins painfully. Ultimatia whispers that this is her ultimate atonement, her way of making up for everything. Back in the present, Ragna wakes up and wonders if he's remembered anything useful. He ignores the thought to think about how Crimson is a real scoundrel, but he still prefers her over Ultimatia. Crimson, in his eyes, is straightforward about being a jerk, while Ultimatia acts kind and tender but commits mass murder on a massive scale. Ragna despises Ultimatia with all his being and vows to hunt her down again. Crimson is also doing some thinking and wonders what price Ragna would be willing to pay to use his full power, which is still unknown at this point. She'd rather wait a few years and prepare thoroughly before attempting to fight Ultimatia. Unfortunately, she knows that the Blood of the Wing is aware of their missing comrades, and she's certain they'll release Walt Camu. 
their strongest dragon. Given this, she decides it's time to ambush Ultimatia. Crimson has a plan in case Ragna loses, and explains that he's an irreplaceable tool for her. They arrive at the capital, and we learn that Crimson hopes to see the winged janitor. We then see Ultimatia talking to her god, who's like a small child. The god wants everything useless destroyed, but the kid doesn't even know what the Lee's kingdom is. Ultimatia decides that Lee's kingdom no longer exists in her god's mind, so it must be obliterated. The dragons will carry out her god's will. Ultimatia seems a bit unstable as she mourns the deaths of her fellow seated dragons. She explains they weren't fit to be part of their bloodline or their god's limbs. She hopes that destroying Lee's kingdom can be an offering to them. Ragna's group arrives in a busy part of the city, and Crimson explains they need to go through the second castle to reach the old district. She wants them to call her Veronica for now, but Ragna isn't listening and is feeling sick in the crowd. Crimson asks what's wrong, and he explains crowds make him feel sick. Crimson mentions that the city he lived in before was big, but he was okay because Leo was always with him. Crimson wonders if they should call off the hunt, but Ragna is determined to end Ultimatia's life if he sees her, no matter how sick he feels. Crimson shows some care and tells him to think of her as Leo's replacement, but he says she could never replace his cherished friend. Crimson tells him to go end himself, and Ragna vomits again. They eventually reach the old district, and Crimson leaves Slime with Ragna to make preparations. She reminds him to stay hidden and not mention the enemy's name or hers. She instructs him to walk away if someone approaches and return to the same place after five minutes. Crimson asks him to repeat her instructions, and Ragna summarizes it as not standing out and staying quiet. Crimson leaves and notices that there are a lot of people around, but something isn't right. The influx of evacuees to the capital should have surpassed 2 million, but the city should be flooded with people. This suggests that the dragons are maliciously reducing the number of people without anyone noticing, like a stomach digesting food. A massacre of the entire population is imminent. In the castle, Nebulum has finished his executions for the day and explains to the armed dragon, Borgus. Borgus asks where is Ultimatia. Nebulum says that she has left as she wanted to see the condition of the evacuee. Borgus is shocked to hear that she went out in public and scolds Nebulum for not stopping her, as it's their duty as mature dragons to protect the progenitor from her impulsive behavior. Borgus has no time for apology, so Nebulum tells him that she is in the old district. Elsewhere, the lieutenant general is handling important business and is interrupted by Crimson. Scene changes and he's on his knees, begging Crimson to inform him about her visits in the future. He pretends it's to properly welcome her. Crimson scolds him and reminds him that she ordered him to gather intelligence by impersonating a high-ranking army officer. His real name is Golem, and he explains that he did his job. She also commands a girl named Chimera to come out and tells her that Ragna will face off with Ultimatia. This shocks everyone and she explains that they all need to cooperate if they want any chance of winning. Meanwhile, Ragna and the slime go to see what people are gathering for. They uncover several frozen dead dragons under a tarp. The citizens are told that their city is facing an unprecedented level of dragon attacks. A man gives an inspiring speech, and as the sun burns up the dragons, he reveals that their army has defeated hundreds of dragons. He assures everyone that they will exterminate every last dragon that poses a threat to the kingdom. The crowd erupts in cheers. The little slime thinks the humans are getting a bit carried away, and mentions that he could swallow the entire crowd in under 60 seconds. Ragna decides to leave, but then he's absolutely stunned as a girl in a hoodie walks by him. His mind races back to one final thing Crimson told him before she left. She said that if by any chance he ran into Ultimatia, he must not attempt to fight her alone because that would surely end the hunt. Despite the seemingly impossible odds, Ragna finds himself in that exact situation. Ultimatia has just walked by him and rage overwhelms every inch of his body. Even more surprisingly, Ultimation, not knowing who he is yet, comes back to check on him. She tells him that he looks awfully sick and asks if he's ill. Ragna struggles to contain his fury. The story continues as Crimson decides that Ragna will face Ultimatia, which surprises Chimera, and Golem. Crimson emphasizes the need for everyone's cooperation to take down the winged monarch. Chimera agrees, but Golem doesn't. He believes their original plan was only to observe the winged monarch, as she destroys the country. Crimson, however, argues that the situation has completely changed because of Ragna. Now they have the best chance to hunt down the winged monarch. Golem persists, saying they shouldn't challenge the winged monarch now. Crimson firmly denies his opinion. Golem continues, pointing out that with his drone eye, he has seen everything that happened when the winged monarch took control of the capital. He mentions that the winged monarch can use time control magic. Crimson reassures him, saying that Ragna will be the one fighting, not Golem and Ragna's combat power is higher than both Golem and Chimera. 
However, Golem points out that after witnessing the power of time control magic, he can't understand how anyone can face such power, even if they are the strongest. Meanwhile, we are shown the first encounter between Ultimatia and Ragna. Ragna spots Ultimatia, but he is confused about whether to fight or wait since Crimson is not there. He sees that she is alone, and he believes he can win a one-on-one -on -one fight, but he is still struggling with his thoughts. Then, his attention falls on the child with Ultimatia. Scene changes as Chimera asks Crimson to ignore Golem because he seems to be overwhelmed by fear. She suggests that she can handle the task herself. Golem questions her decision and goes so far as to call her a dumb beast with low intelligence. In response, Chimera refers to Golem as a pile of junk. She explains that she always considers Lady Veronica's needs and acts accordingly. To prove her point, Golem asks Chimera a simple math question, what's 12 plus 9? However, Chimera struggles to calculate the answer, and Golem makes fun of her, calling her a feather brain. He ridicules her for trying to anticipate Crimson's needs when she can't even answer a basic question that even a child could solve. Crimson intervenes and asks Golem to stop the insults. She reminds them that they are the result of her knowledge and skills, created using different approaches. Insulting each other is equivalent to insulting her. They apologize to Crimson, but their argument soon resumes. Once again, they receive a scolding from Crimson. She brings the conversation back to the topic at hand and asks what they were discussing. Golem then shows his drone, and the drone displays footage of Ultimatia killing the king and reversing time to bring him back to life. Crimson surprises everyone by asking Golem to self-destruct. Confused, Golem questions why she would make such a request. Crimson explains that his earlier statement implied that she's obsessed with Ragna and stands no chance of winning against the winged monarch. Golem realizes the trouble he's in and apologizes. Crimson suggests that Golem self-destruct during the battle, and he asks her for mercy. Meanwhile, Chimera thoroughly enjoys the situation, which annoys Golem. As a result, Crimson kicks Golem and then she points out that Ultimatia's time control magic is not invincible. She explains that the footage itself shows the limitations of this power. The scene changes as a lightning flash destroys a vehicle, and some soldiers get into fighting stances. Volta Kamui approaches them and questions how someone like them managed to defeat the third seat. The soldiers realize that Volta Kamui is even more powerful than the third seat dragon. Volta Kamui observes that death is written on their faces and asks about the person who gave them the silver sword. He tells them they are free to refuse if they have the guts to do it. The scene shifts back to Ragna and Crimson facing each other. The slime advises Ultimatia to keep her distance from Ragna because he might end up getting sick due to the large crowd. Ultimatia apologizes for not realizing this, and the slime forgives her, explaining that everyone makes mistakes. Ragna is holding his sword, and his hand is shaking. But then he suddenly stops and says that he's alright now, reassuring her that she doesn't need to worry about him. Ragna has made the decision not to fight Ultimatia at this moment. He plans to meet with Crimson and continue their hunt for Ultimatia. Ultimatia apologizes for jumping to conclusions and asks him to take care. Ragna questions why she is being kind to the child, and Ultimatia replies that she's doing it because she doesn't need a reason to be kind. Ragna is ready to walk away when Nebulon suddenly arrives. He tells them that Borgus is angry and comments on Ragna's appearance, saying that he looks like a dragon hunter. Ultimatia clarifies that she was the one who stopped to talk, and Ragna is feeling sick because of the crowd. Nebulon notes that some people can feel unwell in such crowded places, and then he suddenly realizes that he's one of them and starts vomiting. Ultimatia decides to find a less crowded place, and when they check on Ragna, he's nowhere to be found. Scene changes, Chimera and Golem continue to watch the recording of Ultimatia's actions. Chimera wonders why Ultimatia is visible in the footage, especially when she stopped in reverse time. She questions why Ultimatia appeared at that precise moment. Golem suggests that it might be due to her running out of magic or limitations in her power. Crimson agrees with him and praises Chimera for her ability to understand the situation and use her intuition effectively, even though she struggles with math. Chimera blushes from the compliments. Crimson explains that Ultimatia can't simultaneously stop and rewind time. This is her major weakness. She proposes an ambush plan to kill Ultimatia. If they kill her, she will use her time control magic to rewind time to her still living body. However, since she is rewinding time, she can't pause it. They can keep destroying her body, and she will be forced to rewind time repeatedly. This would eventually deplete her magic, causing her to die. Golem adds that she might try to counterattack with her massive magical power, but Ragna would fend off her counterattack and manage to kill her. Crimson recalls a conversation with Ragna in which he mentioned that their future selves were able to defeat Ultimatia. She is confident that they can win against her. She informs her servants that they currently only know this method, 
and if Ragna confronts Ultimatia one-on-one, -on -one, he can definitely win. However, Crimson is concerned that Nebulim and Borgus might interfere, so she orders her servants to deal with them. Ragna walks alone in an alley, consumed by thoughts about the decision he just made. Slime notices his sudden change in behavior and asks what's bothering him. Ragna is lost in deep thought, knowing that his future self would have attacked Ultimatia without hesitation. He realizes that when he hesitates, the outcome isn't favorable. While Ragna contemplates, Slime becomes frustrated, feeling ignored by Ragna. Ragna reassures himself that he isn't as enraged as his future self was. Suddenly, a shadow appears, and it's Crimson's presence. The shadow tells Ragna that Crimson doesn't require anger, just his calmness and adherence to orders, which are essential for their mission to eliminate all the dragons. Ragnar reflects on how he managed to maintain his composure, but still feels terrible inside. At this moment, Slime jumps on him, seeking his attention. Ragnar asks Slime if he can contact Crimson, to which Slime reveals that he can indeed reach her. Slime then takes out a device and shows it to Ragnar. Ragnar requests that Slime send a message to Crimson, informing her that he has located the target, and he decides to continue his mission on his own. Meanwhile, Crimson is faced with the challenging task of boosting the morale of her loyal minions. She acknowledges that they are willing to sacrifice their lives for, but also realizes they don't fully trust Ragna due to his human nature and his pivotal role. Despite this, she believes she can subtly influence Ragna in the future due to his extraordinary powers. As Crimson plans to share her strategy with her servants, Slime contacts her. She wonders why Slime reached out but remembers her previous instructions to stay hidden, refrain from interacting with others, and watch over Ragna. In a surprising twist, Slime tells Crimson that Ragna has betrayed them, leaving her in shock. Meanwhile, Ultimatia helps a boy reunite with his parents but inquires with Nebulum about whether the boy's family is included in the day's list of people scheduled to disappear. Nebulum confirms their inclusion, stating he can make people within his barrier vanish without causing them suffering. Ultimatia acknowledges the grim fate of humanity, but desires to bring them happiness before they vanish. She reflects on the effectiveness of displaying the dragon corpses to provide solace to the humans. Ragna overhears this conversation and listens as Nebulum explains his ability to make people vanish. Ultimatia believes that the end is near for humans but wants to ensure their contentment before their disappearance. Ragna returns to the scene and openly expresses his disgust with Ultimatia's behavior. He admits his anger and deep determination to defeat the dragons, feeling ashamed of himself for initially choosing to walk away. Ultimatia expresses her confusion about Ragna's words, but suddenly, Ragna begins his fierce assault. Nebulum's body disintegrates, and Ragna prepares for battle. Realizing that Nebulum was their enemy, Ultimatia attempts to stop time, but Ragna swiftly attacks, slicing her into pieces. She reverses time to restore her body, but Ragna strikes her with a powerful punch, sending her flying. He continues his relentless attack, preventing her from using her time control abilities. Despite her attempts to counterattack, Ragna overwhelms her, ultimately telling her that the greatest kindness she can offer to the people is to meet her end at his hands. Crimson is surprised to learn that Ragna is fighting against Ultimatia. She wonders why it was so easy to find her and realizes that the plan was originally to test Ragna's strength. If Ragna can defeat Ultimatia, the plan will succeed. However, if things go wrong, he needs to handle the situation. While watching the fight, Crimson receives a message from a girl informing her that the two big dragons they were looking for can't be found. Crimson remembers that when the battle started, the protective barrier around the capital disappeared. She thinks Nebulum might be gone and tells Chimera to come back. Golem notices that Borg has left the castle, and he receives the order to stop Borg. He follows the orders but mentions that it's hard to actually kill Borg because the body he's using is very limited. Crimson clarifies that the goal is just to slow Borg down, not to kill him. At the same time, Ultimatia is continuously getting hit without keeping count of how many times she's been killed. She's starting to feel like she's running out of time to come back to life. Borg tries to help Ultimatia, but Golem attacks him from far away and messes up his dragon form. Meanwhile, Ragna gets trapped in a magic barrier created by Nebula. Ragna notices that the kid is almost dead, and Nebula, trying to stay strong for Ultimatia to escape, decides to use her own blood to summon dragons to attack Ragna. However, Ragna uses super strong silverine magic to break Nebulum's barrier. Nebulum tries to strengthen her magic to restrain Ragna, but Slime shows up, eats Nebula, and frees Ragna. Ultima has already left, but Ragna goes after her and attacks with his powerful silverine magic. Ragna takes Ultimatia away from the capital, declaring that he won't hold back anymore. Ultimatia decides to use her last trick and turns back time, bringing everything to the moment where the dragons were burned. 
Something feels off to Ragna, and Ultimatia shows up behind him, stopping time. She explains that it takes a lot of magic to rewind the whole world, so she doesn't use it often. Ultimatia says the battle is done, but she's unsure what to do with Ragna. She notices Ragna doesn't like her, though she doesn't know why. Despite wanting to understand more, she decides it's better to kill him. She relocates the humans elsewhere, leaving only her and Ragna. She promises a gentle death, but realizes Ragna is with slime and wonders about the kid. Before she can think more, she notices Ragna moved his finger, surprising her because time isn't rewinding. Nebulum shows up behind Ultimatia and attacks Ragna for revenge. Ultimatia sees Ragna isn't moving, confirming he didn't move during that weird time. She tells Nebulum to stop attacking, but Nebulum says the enemy is still alive. Ultimatia explains that Ragna broke all defenses, and Nebulum's hits can't hurt him. She thinks of Ragna's body like a strong silver sword, tough against magic. Ultimatia asks Borg to tell the king to use a powerful light attack on Ragna, and requests Nebulum to make a barrier for safety. Ragna starts getting up, blocking Ultimatia's way to escape. Even though he's moving slowly, it's still scary for her. She attacks him, realizing her time control isn't working completely. Crimson explains that when Ultimatia uses time magic control, she can choose to let certain people move while others stay frozen. In this case, she probably chose some of her family members to move but accidentally let Ragna move too. Ragna keeps moving forward, and Nebulum tries to shield Ultimatia with his barrier. However, Ragna smashes through all of them with his head, finally getting close to Ultimatia. Ragna sees that the Dragon Monarch looks scared of him, but Ultimatia resets everything back to normal. Even though time goes back, Ragna can still move and flies toward them. He breaks through all the barriers she tries to put up, getting closer to hurting her. Suddenly, he stops and starts bleeding from his face, feeling pain all over his body. Ragnar realizes he's suffering because he used his future powers too much and falls to the ground, bleeding a lot. The king shoots the aurora ray at Ragnar. After the dust clears, Nebula sees a human woman, but her face is hidden. Borg advises Ultima to freeze time so she can escape, but she's too shocked by seeing Ragnar hurt. Crimson comments that Ragna is in bad shape because he didn't heed advice, and she wonders what to do with Nebula. Crimson reflects that Ultimatia always disliked battles, viewing them as contests of strength. Despite her confidence in time control, Ultimatia is now traumatized and fearful after Ragna shattered her beliefs. Crimson no longer sees Ultimatia as the formidable winged monarch, but as a weak and scared girl. Despite the opportunity, Ultimatia is hesitant to eliminate Ragna, shaken by her perceived failure in magic. Nebula tries to bring Ultimatia back to reality, but she's still disturbed by her defeat. To Crimson's surprise, Ultimatia attempts another spell, but Crimson detonates a building, distracting her. More explosions follow around the capital, shocking Ultimatia, who wanted to give a painless death. Crimson, with a sinister smile, revels in causing pain, death, and despair. Tens of thousands have died, and more explosions continue. Crimson challenges Ultimatia on what the compassionate dragon will do as people suffer in the streets. Crimson knows Ultimatia can save them with her power. Ultimatia, feeling helpless, decides to use her power to rewind the world, but Nebula stops her, warning it will deplete all her magic. Annoyed, Crimson decides to withdraw, leaving Ultimatia in tears as she witnesses the suffering. Crimson encounters Golem in an alley and berates him for not planting a bomb in the clock tower and not having enough explosives on the castle walls. Annoyed, Crimson punishes Golem by sticking a bottle in his eye. Crimson is angry because Golem didn't follow orders, but Golem apologizes, explaining his distraction in the area. Crimson forces the bottle deeper, revealing that Ultimatia would have used her spell if those places were destroyed. Crimson walks away, mentioning this is the last time Golem disobeys orders. Golem complies but is shocked that Crimson realized his intentions. Crimson opens a door with his key, and instructs Golem to stay back and dispose of his current body, monitoring the bloodline's movements in his base form. Golem is frightened as it's a literal punishment, but Crimson asserts he doesn't need a servant who tests his master. Golem is surprised that Crimson saw through his intentions, realizing his boss is the same psycho he always knew. Meanwhile, Nebulum still has Ultimatia in his arm and starts crying. After all, he was useless and couldn't do anything. He then remembers a conversation he had with Borg about the dragon maturation period. In short, it's the time they take to adapt to their progenitor's blood. The quicker they go through this period, the higher their potential. Zora took one year, while Volta Kamui took only two days. However, Nebulin was a split second. In short, his potential as a bloodline member is the highest in dragon history. He is supposed to become Ultimatia's backbone, 
but he still isn't able to protect her. He doesn't understand how he is supposed to surpass Volta Kemui because Volta Kemui would prevent all of this. He realizes how weak he is and desires to become stronger. Suddenly, magic engulfs his body, and it starts to spin around. Crimson senses something and realizes that Nebulum has evolved. This guy, with his new power, promises that he will find both Ragna and Crimson. Crimson realizes Nebulum's new potential, knowing that Nebulum is sensing him in another spatial realm and is looking for him. However, Crimson knows Nebulum won't be able to find him because Crimson created this room during his prime. It's a gate connected to every part of the world, making it impossible to find him. Despite Nebulum's sudden increase in power, he won't be able to touch him even if he finds him. It's impossible to break through using outside forces. Crimson then links up with his lunar base. He thinks things didn't go according to plan, but the outcome was quite amazing. He decides to begin his preparations for the next few years and decides to leave upon hearing those words. Ragna starts to remember his time with Leo. He forces his body to get up and tells Crimson he won't be leaving. He falls to the side and repeats he won't leave until he finishes his job to hunt Ultimatia. He tries to force his body up and get back to fight again. He tells Crimson he knows this is a teleportation room and says he will return. Crimson tries to calm him down, mentioning the battle is over and the results are amazing. Crimson blushes while claiming that Ragna is stronger than expected, which is weirder than his psycho smile. Crimson laughs it out, mentioning how Ultimatia looked pathetic while panicking. But for now, Ragna must rest, or Crimson will take his head. Ragna gets angry, shouting that he doesn't care about Crimson's feelings, he just cares about killing Ultimatia. He doesn't want to let her live for another second and forces his body up. He uses all his willpower to activate his Silverine Battle Arts aura, claiming he will go back. Crimson cannot believe Ragna has still this much power, and tells Chimera to restrain him. Crimson then steps on Ragna's head, complaining that he tried to use his technique. He calls him a stupid idiot, and promises to kill him if Ragna damages this chamber. The Silverine Battle Arts and Alternative Dimensions cannot be paired together, and just by using his aura, Ragna made a small crack in this pocket dimension. Crimson decides to quickly fix the crack, but Nebulum has found them. Crimson cannot believe this is possible and tries to open the door, but it doesn't bulge. Nebulum claims he will destroy the barrier and drag them out of there. Crimson realizes the door doesn't open because of the combination of Ragna and Nebul powers. Crimson starts to freak out, calling Nebulum an idiot who devotes himself to Ultimatia. He yells at Nebulum to know his place and orders Golem to kill him. Golem, who was hiding in a building, headshots Nebulum with a Silverine sniper, despite losing part of his head. Nebulum tells Borg to attack the sniper, however, there's something more dangerous right now, Ragna. Chimera cannot restrain him anymore, and he manages to break free. He gets up, using all his power, and decides to confront Nebulum. Each of them makes a promise that they will kill each other. Crimson cannot believe what the hell is happening right now, their power is completely destroying her magic. She gets mad at Ragna because he's helping their enemy ruin his plan. But Ragna is still powering up all his aura. We then see the military training ground of Northeast Lees. There's a girl complaining that dragons were supposed to attack this place tonight, but the dragon's killing intent was suddenly disturbed. The guy then comes, calling her princess and wants to report something. He first questions why she is eating that piece of meat. She replies that dragons kill people, so she will eat dragons too. In retaliation, the guy informs their teleportation circle underground drew someone in. She asks if it's a dragon, but the guy says it's better for her to make the judgment. Meanwhile, we see a blindfolded crimson being escorted by guards. He thinks that he's quite unlucky because they were expelled from the globe chamber and arrived at a random location. Crimson is usually prepared for this situation, but this place is just the worst possible scenario. He woke up and already had a blade at his neck. He wanted to get out of the country, but he ended up being captured by the worst possible person in the kingdom. She then meets Princess Starlia, who's the commander of the Royal Army's special troops. Starlia welcomes Crimson and asks her subordinates for an explanation. Her subordinate explains they drew a magic circle and two guys randomly appeared. He also explains the circle isn't damaged, so their mission won't be affected. Starlia laughs and then asks about Ragna. The second person, her advisor, replies that Ragna is in critical condition and cannot talk. However, they already tested his blood and confirmed that he isn't a dragon, therefore, he's being taken care of. They didn't test Crimson's blood because he agreed to answer some question. Starlia decides to deal with Crimson, but first offers him some dragon meat to eat. Crimson follows the instructions, but starts puking it out when Starlia reveals its dragon meat. Staria laughs it out, but Crimson thinks about all the information he has about Starlia. She was born with no arms, but her eyes can sense the aura emitted by all matter 
and that aura allowed her to move anything like telekinesis. The first thing she controlled was a silverware set, and she became known as the Silverware Princess. By the age of six, she took three inferior dragons by herself. Two years later, she slayed a horde of dragons, including two medial ones. In short, she quickly became full of talents, winning tournaments and creating gear to destroy dragons. But that's not the reason Crimson hates her. He hates her because Starlia's eyes allow her to see lies. Starlia then opens her eyes and begins the questioning. She asks who Crimson is and how he got there. Crimson decides to think about this whole situation before replying. He knows Starlia wants to use the magic circle to flee the country because Sora and Terra are pursuing them, and they have no chance against those dragons. In short, Starlia's goal and Crimson's match up. He thinks they should cooperate and escape to a secure area. However, the biggest problem is how Crimson will trick her. The princess can see the aura changes based on emotions, which makes it hard for Crimson. He thinks that he needs to act but includes something real about himself to convince Starlia. He blames Ragna for being in this whole situation while he's just sleeping. The princess starts to complain because Crimson hasn't responded in two seconds. Crimson apologizes but realizes that Starlia doesn't notice how annoyed she is. So, he concludes he can trick her with lies by using his aura. He then decides to show one of his eyes, making everyone startled. They call him a dragon, but Crimson introduces himself as Chris Weiss, a thaumaturge. Taken back seven years in time to a moment when young Startlia encountered a general named Pereira. It was a dark night, and Startlia was alone near the military headquarters. Intrigued, Pereira approached her, wondering why she was there at such a late hour. He seemed uneasy but inquired about how he could assist her. In response, Startlia flashed a smile and cryptically mentioned that she was going to purge him. Suddenly, she drew a sword and swiftly stabbed the general resulting in his demise. This shocking incident led people to believe that Startlia was mentally unstable, a notion reinforced by her unexpected act. However, upon closer inspection and thorough investigation, it became apparent that General Pereiro had been involved in a conspiracy to overthrow the government, orchestrating a coup d'etat with the assistance of the neighboring country, Garnas. Curiosity lingered, and many questioned Startlia about how she had prior knowledge of the general's sinister plans. In response, she calmly asserted that she knew who needed to be eliminated for the greater good. Crimson explains that some people are born with great magical power, or non-human characteristics. One group of such individuals is called Thaumaturges. For Crimson, his dragon eyes could be useful in the current situation. However, he remembers that Princess Starlia tends to kill those who cause her distrust just by looking at them. Despite the risk, Crimson decides to expose his dragon eyes and confront her directly. He introduces himself as Chris Weiss, a thaumaturge, but he usually hides his real identity and pretends to work as an apothecary in the capital. Isaac, upon hearing this, asks about the situation in the capital. Crimson, maintaining his aura, explains that the capital used to be peaceful, but it became a target for dragons, leading to the accommodation of refugees. Crimson reports that recently there have been multiple explosions in the capital, and Isaac questions the extent of the damage. Crimson admits he doesn't know the details because he used teleportation magic to escape the chaos with his servant. Crimson feels that not revealing his responsibility for the explosions is crucial. He explains that he ended up in his magic circle without realizing it. Isaac then asks if the capital fell into the hands of dragons, and few wonders where Crimson would have studied magic. Crimson states that studying such high-level magic alone is impossible, especially for powerful military-grade spells like teleportation. Few asks if Crimson is a Solarian defector, and Crimson refocuses on keeping up the performance. He denies being a Solarian defector, and Few believes his acting, mentioning the ruthlessness against deserters. Crimson reflects on inventing this story and explains that the Solari religion is powerful, and their magical techniques surpass those of ordinary humans. He suggests becoming an auxiliary advisor to the princess's plans, as it would benefit them to have a Solarian on their side. The Starlia princess acknowledges Crimson's skill and lie and claims to perceive the truth through aura fluctuation. She explains that a blue aura indicates truth, while a red aura signifies lying. Starlia reveals this sensory ability is unique to her but admits it's still possible to deceive her, though challenging. Observing Crimson's aura, she notices it's blue but smells a suspicious scent in that color. Crimson gets angry but composes himself, admitting that he partially lied but affirming that he is a thaumaturge who fled the capital. Then the princess presents Crimson with a sword she made and asks him to hold it. Crimson questions why, and she responds that it's because he is a top-notch liar. She explains that she gives weapons to those she favors, and Crimson is one of them. As Crimson holds the weapon, the princess's expression changes. She asks for her sword back and explains to Crimson that she wasn't born with arms, so she couldn't hold the sword. 
Instead, she uses silver implements, and these swords are like her own body parts. With them, she can see past emotions and perceive the true nature of things. The princess then provides an example through Isak, describing him as old-fashioned, too serious, and avoiding enjoyable activities. Isak asks for clarification and she explains that there is no difference between his appearance and his true nature. The four eyes get angry and ask her to be more serious. Starlia then gives another example, introducing an old man as Swordmaster Garm. She describes him as someone whose body and sword are in harmony. She expresses joy at the idea of becoming one with a sword, as it requires going through an insane amount of hardship, resulting in a beautiful form. She adds that if she is going to marry someone, it should be someone with a more beautiful form than Garm but she hasn't encountered anyone like that until now. Starlia returns to Crimson and summarizes by emphasizing that a person's true nature is revealed by the way they've lived, and it can't be fake. Considering this, she describes Crimson's true nature as a pitch-black mass of death. Starlia instructs everyone to prepare to attack Crimson, and questions him about the number of people he has killed and whether he caused the explosion in the capital. Despite the accusations, Crimson maintains his act, claiming it's all a misunderstanding. Starlia clarifies that the issue isn't whether Crimson is a dragon or a person, it's about the darkness of his aura, surpassing even Dornia. Crimson, still acting, asks Few for help, stating that they are similar and urges Few to convince Starlia that she can be helpful. However, Few, loyal to their commander, refuses, explaining that they follow the commander's decisions, as that's how the Corps operates. Starlia raises her weapon, considering it fortunate to have encountered Crimson, and declares that he must die. She attacks him, and although Crimson appears to scream, he's actually relaxed because he knows he won't die. Starlia reflects that if she hadn't tried so hard to unveil his true nature, they could have worked things out. However, she now believes that if she kills him, he'll retreat to his base and await an opportunity to escape with Ragna. Starlia reveals that Ulto Zora and Terektra are approaching to slaughter them, and they must fight with all they have. However, this is no longer Crimson's problem. Suddenly, Ragna intervenes, stopping Starlia's blade, surprising her. Ragna declares that hunting Crimson is his duty, and expresses ignorance about the situation. He questions Crimson about whether he did something terrible again. Despite the accusations, Crimson continues to act, claiming to be the victim in the situation. Isak wonders where he came from until he sees Graham lying on the floor. He then checks on the princess, who is head over heels. Her maid helps her up, and Starlia points at Ragna, saying that he is a sword with arms. Ragna, on the other hand, doesn't understand and asks Crimson if he did something. Crimson asserts that it's not him but Ragna's fault. This is when Crimson realizes that the Silver Princess sees the world differently from normal people. So when she sees Ragna, who has surpassed the level of strength infused with a sword, his silver sword, she sees Ragna as a guy with a body of a sword who has arms and legs. The princess is completely in shock, and other soldiers ask what Ragna did, but he doesn't know anything. Then they start attacking him, but he defeats them with one punch. Everyone sees this in shock, and the Silver Princess can't believe that there is a man who is completely fused with a sword. In a flashback, we see the princess where her maid asks her to come out as she is no longer grounded. She says she forgot since she was engrossed in making the sword. She praises her own sword and herself, claiming to be a genius. The maid tells her that because of her stupid mistakes, her engagement has been called off. Starlia tells her that she doesn't care as she isn't interested in marriage anyway, but if she wants to still do it, she has to bring someone who will make her fall head over heels. Back to the present, we see the princess is completely in love with Ragna's body figure and the silverine aura, but the weird thing is she sees his head as a sword to be the most handsome. She is riz by a sword. She asks her maid what she should do as she finds him unbelievably hot. Ragna is still confused. Isak tells her to be serious and asks if Ragna is also an enemy. Ragna asks Crimson what is happening, and Crimson is surprised by the princess's reaction. Ragna tries to ask the princess, but she is too shy to talk and completely behaving like a tsundir. Starlia asks her maid what she should do, but even the maid is confused. So Ragna tells them that they don't intend to fight. If they don't attack Crimson, they will obey their order. So the four eyes put them in jail and ask them to wait until they decide what to do with them. Ragna then tells Crimson that they need to talk, and Crimson agrees. The scene changes, and we see Ragna under Crimson's foot. Ragna asks why Crimson tried to run. But Crimson asks why he tried to interfere in his plan. Ragna tells him that he doesn't want to run because the more time they take to kill Ultimation, the more people she will kill. But Crimson tells him that, in the end, he lost, and he had to come and take him out. But he resisted and broke her vital creation, the globe of the chamber. Crimson tells Ragna that both Chimera and Golem are missing. He asks him how he is going to compensate for his losses. Ragna tells him that he will hunt Ultimatia. 
This irritates Crimson, so he stomps on him. Ragna tells Crimson that it hurts, but Crimson tells him that he is just adjusting his stupid behavior. Crimson then tells Ragna that he really overdid it in the battle earlier. Ragna, misunderstanding, thinks he is being praised and suggests that when he recovers, they should go to the capital right away. Crimson gets angry because Ragna can't understand a single thing that Crimson wants to tell him. Ragna then asks if the slime is dead. Crimson says that he forgot about him. He then takes a small part of it that is sticking to Ragna and uses some of her hair to revive him. And just three minutes later, Slime Sensei is back but in mini form. This again tells Ragna it's all his fault. Ragna apologizes, and Slime asks where they are. Crimson explains that they are at the military training ground of Northern Lees. He explains that it's an ancient facility that was restored. Crimson reveals that the people in the base are in real danger. The scene then changes to people in the base asking the soldier about the time they will need to stay there, as it has already been day. The people are protesting and demand to see the Silver Princess, but they are not allowed entry beyond this point. Isaac says that the situation is getting worse. He says that he understands their rage as they are not given any reason and are forced to stay underground. Few tells him that this is exactly what happens when they take 15 O people without any plan. Isaac argues that if they had not taken them in, they would have gone to the capital, so how can they abandon these people knowing that they are going to fall into a death trap? But Few knows that they are just saving these humans to motivate the soldiers. Few asks if they are done here because, unlike Isaac, they have to do all the dirty work without much benefit. Isaac changes the topic and tells Zhu to keep Ragna and Crimson's presence secret. He explains that the morale of the knights will fall if they know that two such powerful people are living among them. Suddenly, Christopher and Shin rush to them and ask if Graham really got defeated. Isaac asks how they know about it, and Christopher tells them that Graham himself told them. He explains that they came back from scouting and found him sobbing in the corridor. Isaac says that it's understandable since he is the strongest swordsman in the country and the nearby countries. He defeated a lot of dragons and even gave the final blow to Dornia. Yet, he was defeated by a punk who is not even half his age. Meanwhile, the old man is crying and is in his own world thinking about the princess who is like his daughter and getting married. Shin asks Isaac to let him fight Ragna, but he denies and asks them to report the situation with the dragon. But they tell him to shut up as they are dragon hunters, not his knights. Two girls named Gree and Hesla come in and ask Isaac if Starlia has fallen in love with the intruder at first sight. The two girls tell that everyone is gossiping about it and start asking a bunch of questions to Isaac. The scene changes, and we see the princess completely immersed in her thoughts with Ragna's sword Riz. But she suddenly gets slapped by her maid. She asks what she is doing. The maid explains that usually, she would have dodged that slap. But ever since she has fallen for that man, she is absent-minded. Hearing this, she shows her tsunder form once again, but the maid doesn't show any mercy and punches her. She asks her to accept that she is in love. The silver princess accepts it but not without ranting about Ragnar's riz. The maid tells her that as her tutor, she is happy for her, even if she has just fallen for his looks. The maid then tells her that the Argentum Corps is a mighty corps with maximum people in the top 100, but they are nothing without her. Her strength and her charisma as a leader are what bring many people under her command. There are many people who support her, but no one can replace her. The maid tells Starlia that being in love is good, but she shouldn't forget her duty as she is the hope of everyone here. Starlia shoots back at the maid, saying that she is putting so much weight on her shoulders. What would happen if she gets crushed under it? The maid says that there are some people who shine most when they are underweight. The princess then gets excited, saying that she must be one of such people. The scene changes to the capital, where Nebulum is sitting with a sad look. We then see Ultimatia, who is talking to a child. Apparently, that child is the dragon god. She apologizes because, despite giving her all the power, she was still defeated by an enemy. But she tells the child not to fret as she will kill him. But suddenly, the child comes to Ultimatia and asks her why didn't she save her and cries, saying it hurt. Ultimatia gets scared, and suddenly, she wakes up and tries to use her power, but she can't use it. We see that Argentum Corps is having a meeting. Starlia asks Christopher and Shin to report the situation. They explain that the dragons are behaving strangely. There is no activity until this morning, and the dragons don't seem to be out for blood. Christopher tells that even after they got very close to their hideout, there was no indication that the dragons would immediately attack if a signal was given. The twins also report that they felt the same thing, and it seems like dragons are preoccupied with something, as the air felt like there was a funeral. Starlia wonders what is wrong with the superior dragons. She thinks that they're somewhere else and thinks about Crimson's statement, but she feels that there's no definite proof that Crimson was telling the truth. Starlia then tells everyone that she is not sure why they're acting this way, but this is a good opportunity. Isaac asks what she means by it. 
Starlia then explains that the dragons certainly do not want to let them off the hook. If that were the case, they would have raised their siege. She explains that some issue must have cropped up for the superior dragons that temporarily takes priority over them. She tells that it is utterly insulting, but she explains that it's an insult to be thankful for. She asks Majorca, how much longer will the teleportation circle take to prepare? She tells her it'll take two days if they work themselves to death. Starlia then tells her to ask Few to get it done in one day without anyone dying. Meanwhile, Majorca is getting pleasure from Starlia being too close. Starlia then tells them that their country has already lost. She explains that on the first night, five cities in the capital fell. They cannot fathom just how many citizens have been devoured by dragons. The only thing they can do is flee the country with only the 1500 citizens they've gathered in their base. She tells that it is entirely disgraceful, but they shall escape. Starlia tells that they'll show those loathsome dragons they can't always have their way with them, and they will survive with everyone. But Crimson interrupts her, saying that was fantastic, and she expected nothing less from the renowned silverware princess. Shin asks Ragna and Crimson who they are. Isaac tells them to calm down. Starlia feels shy but acts strong and tells them that she was going to pretend she never saw them for a while, but they decided to make an appearance. Filth. Both Shin and Christopher ask Ragna what he did to the commander. Isaac tells them to calm down as they have already discussed it. Shin says that Ragna doesn't look strong at all. Greya asks Hesela if she thinks one of those two might be him. Hesela tells her that definitely, it must be one of them. Ragna thinks that this is an incredibly skilled group. There are even people who are stronger than Leo here. Isaac asks what happened to the guards. Crimson then tells that he asked them to let them through, and they very kindly obliged. Isaac doesn't believe it. Crimson ignores him and tells Starlia that they'd like to lend them a hand in their escape plan. He tells them that he got the gist of their plan. Crimson explains that they want to use Dragon's blood as a magical energy source and teleport out of the country. Crimson tells that it's a solid plan, but it won't be successful. He explains to them that the difference in military power between them and their enemy is too great. Crimson tells Starlia that if she allows them to work together with her, she will give them detailed intel about the enemy. Not only that, she can provide them with a superweapon capable of slaying superior dragons unassisted and introduces Ragna. Crimson tells Starlia that they must cooperate to take down the two superior dragons who are their enemy. If they don't, they'll all die here together. While Crimson is saying all this, Starlia is happy to know Ragna's name. Everyone waits for her reply, and soon they quarrel among each other. Isaac worries about Starlia as she is losing her mind again. Suddenly, the maid hits Starlia and knocks her to the table. Starlia is mad at Crimson for offering help, calling him a nasty stain on the world. She knows he's the type to use and get people killed. Shin tells her this isn't her usual way of doing things, asking if they should just kill Crimson or not. Ragna steps in, saying it's his job to deal with Crimson. Starlia, still upset, tells Crimson they won't work with him and orders him back to his cell. She warns she'll kill him if she sees his face again. She even tells Ragna to go back to their cell, threatening him too. Crimson then explains about Mad Dragon, Olto Zora, the sixth seat of the Blood of the Wing. He handles military matters and has a unique power called chemical synthesis, allowing him to create deadly drugs and compounds. His chemicals are ineffective in sunlight, and Silverine can stop them. Knowing this information is crucial for combating him. When he uses these chemicals on his forces, it becomes a nuisance, enhancing his dragon army's power and giving him control over hypnotized dragons due to his status as a superior dragon. Isaac questions where Crimson got such detailed intel on superior dragons. Then, Starlia asks for a guarantee of the information's truth. Crimson says they'd know if he lied, but Starlia remains suspicious of him. Crimson then brings Ragna forward. Ragna is asked to persuade the silverware princess, but he thinks it's impossible. Crimson believes that Ragna, even if talking nonsense, could win her favor. He asks Ragna if he has made up his mind or not to stay here and fight. We are then taken aback where Crimson tells Ragna that he estimates that the number of dragons attacking this base will be at least 10,000. Out of that, 9,000 are inferior dragons, 1,000 are medial dragons, and about 40 to 50 will be mature dragons. They also have a mobile front to transport them, the Writhing Shade. There's a high probability the 13th seat has been mobilized too. Also, two superior dragons will lead them, Ultozora and Teratra. Their military force will be total overkill. There are 350 soldiers here, as well as 1,500 civilians under their protection, and none will survive. He asks Ragna whether the Silverware Princess and her comrades in the future. Crimson tells Ragna that if he promises to follow his orders and give up on Ultimatia for a short while so they can escape the country, he'll use the full extent of his powers to make sure the humans at this base escape the dragons. 
And when he says the full extent of his powers, that includes him. Crimson asks him once again whether he is going to break it off with him and go back to the capital by himself or stay and fight to protect the people here, then flee the country together. Back to the present, Ragna asks Starlia if they could work together. Starlia was surprised and said she won't work with Ragna just because he looks good. That doesn't mean she will listen to him. Ragnar reminded Starlia that she had called Crimson filth before. He agreed with her and said Crimson enjoys hurting others, and he's a despicable person who loves tormenting others for kicks. Ragna even called Crimson a piece of shit, which gets Starlia excited. Ragna wondered why someone like Crimson even exists, and said he often thinks everyone would be better off if he could just get rid of him. But Ragna trusts Crimson's desire to kill dragons, so they decided to team up to exterminate dragons. Starlia asked if they were going to kill all dragons, and Ragna said he's really good at hunting dragons and wants to help. Everyone was curious about Starlia's expression. The maid explained that Starlia is in love with Ragna, and she's struggling with the idea of using him. Majorka warned Starlia not to agree because Ragna is undoubtedly a pervert who puts up pictures of his crush in his room. She knows this because she can always sniff out other freaks like her. The maid explained that Ragna is Starlia's first love. She doesn't know how to react around him and she can't allow herself to look like a pathetic simp in front of the core. Starlia reluctantly agreed to work with Ragna, but she made it clear she is temporarily borrowing his power for strategic purposes, not because she has feelings for him. Crimson made a joke about Starlia acting like a tsundir. Starlia got mad at Crimson, but he found it funny. Crimson tells Ragna that she is not a fan of being called a piece of shit, but she says that she will let it slide since the silverware princess had her in stitches. But Ragna tells Crimson that he asked him to do it. Isaac wasn't sure if the situation was good or bad. Christopher asked if Starlia was serious about the plan, and Starlia says she is. Shin then asks about his fight with Ragna, and Starlia says that he has to wait. Crimson praised the decision and suggested modifying the plan based on his information. Starlia interrupted and told Crimson to share information only about dragons. She insisted on doing the planning. Crimson agreed but asked Starlia to make sure her plan had no mistakes because fixing them later would be a hassle. Starlia then asked Crimson about changes in dragon behavior, and Crimson explained they had fought the winged monarch in the capital. Everyone was surprised, and Crimson said the dragons might be heading to the capital in a frenzy. In the capital, Zora expresses his anger by knocking Borgias. Borgias admits he has no excuses. Tor asks about Ultimatia's whereabouts, and he tells them she's in her room crying. Kamui arrives and informs Ultimatia that she has lost her power to control time, as he had mentioned before. Ultimatia questions why he's there when she specifically told Nebulum not to let anyone enter. Kamui responds that Nebulum allowed him in. Ultimatia accuses Kamui of lying and threatens Nebulum, accusing him of letting Kamui in forcibly. She asks Kamui to leave, as she is not in the mood to chat. Kamui interrupts, claiming he has a souvenir for her, and Ultimatia questions whose head it is. Kamui reminds her of the task she sent him for. Ultimatia accuses Kamui of lying, threatens Nebulum again, and insists he leaves. Kamui, undeterred, says he has a souvenir for her, and Ultimatia questions whose head it is. Kamui responds by asking if she forgot the purpose of his mission. Ultimatia asks if the head is from the person who killed Twa, and Kamui questions if she thinks a lowly hunter could have killed Twa. He describes the hunter as weak but dedicated, a true dragon hunter. Ultimatia refuses to hear the dying words of someone who suffered. Kamui asserts that to him. Almost everyone in the world is insignificant trash, but he'll keep the dying words between him and the hunter if Ultimatia isn't interested. Changing the topic, Kamui mentions a sword he obtained from a dragon hunter. Ultimatia has a vision of facing Ragna. Kamui describes the sword's crude craftsmanship, but chilling silvering and fusion. Ultimatia pleads for him to take it away. Kamui insists she not be shaken by it. Ultimatia, feeling the sword, realizes it's cold. Kamui asks if she wants him to explain why she can't control time anymore. He attributes it to her losing in her heart, not some divine disappointment. He explains that her heart is too beaten down to rule over anything. Ultimatia wonders if this means she has a mental problem, and Kamui asks if she sees her enemy's image every time she uses magic. She confirms and shares an incident where her enemy moved even when time was stopped. Kamui mocks her as Traumatia and suggests forgetting her fear to regain control over time. Ultimatia struggles, and Kamui proposes commanding him to obliterate the source of her fear. Ultimatia refuses, stating it's her personal failure, and her priority is to annihilate the country as the winged progenitor. Volta Kamui asks Ultimatia to tell him what she really wants and desires. He wonders if she wants revenge. Ultimatia is confused, so Volta Kamui shares his feelings, expressing anger that someone tried to harm her while he was away. 
Ultimatia attacks and questions when she became his woman. She asks how long he'll keep clowning around and making a fool of her. If he doesn't intend to listen, he should go ahead and fight. Volta Kamui says he wants to fight because she ordered him to. He won't bow to her as the progenitor or worship her like a saint. To him, she's just an unhinged woman, and he follows her willingly without caring about God, allegiance, or blood ties. He assures her that she can be herself around him, expressing emotions like anger or sadness. He promises to always be by her side. Ultimatia insists she can't allow that for herself, as she has a duty to God, her bloodline, and the people they've killed. Volta Kamui says he doesn't doubt her true feelings, but clarifies that's not what he's asking. Ultimatia then blames Ragna for everything, expressing frustration and a desire for revenge. She orders Volta Kamui to kill them and bring their heads. Volta Kamui agrees, saying her wish is his command. They meet Zora, who apologizes for not being there when Ultimatia needed him. Ultimatia apologizes for making them worry and assures them she's okay. She asks Nebulum if Volta Kamui threatened him to enter her chamber, and Volta Kamui says Nebulum was cool with it. Nebulum confirms this and thinks about getting closer to Ultimatia's heart like Volta Kamui. Volta Kamui recalls killing Michael, and his last words about the Reaper hunting him. He expresses excitement about facing an unseen opponent for a historic fight to the death. We see Ragna infusing his silverine aura into the weapon. The princess then asks Isaac to test Ragna's silverine sword against her. Isaac strikes the princess's sword, creating a crack in it. Everyone is surprised to see this, and Crimson tells them that it's expected, boasting that Ragna has only put in a bit of silverine. The princess asks if it will remain boosted for a long period of time. Ragna explains that normally, the swords won't endure as long because they might lose to the power of silvery, but this sword is well made, so that is not a problem. The princess says that these are the swords she personally made and tells Ragna that his silverine is not half bad. Isaac feels relieved as the princess can somehow hold a conversation with Ragna. The maid says that she has set her mind on the course of attitude she should take. We see that the reason she is able to hold a conversation is that she has closed her eyes. The princess then asks them to bring all the weapons to Ragna. The scene changes, and we see that Ragna is fighting some soldiers and also infusing Silverine into their sword. One by one, soldiers attack him, but he defeats them and infuses their weapons with Silverine. After defeating a bunch of soldiers, Ragna wonders if it's a good idea for him to be doing this. He then gets a flashback of Crimson informing him to leave half of the Silverine for himself and use half to infuse the core weapons. He also tells him not to use Silverine battle arts in the next fight because it might turn bad if he does. Ragna thinks to himself that he knows that his body is not in the best condition, but his body can still move, and fighting by himself would be the best course. However, he is confused as to why Crimson asked him not to use Silverine Battle Art. He wonders why these people really want to cut him in half and if he did anything that made them mad. If he did, he wants to say sorry. He is clueless as ever, but the soldiers are upset because of Silverware Princess. They are upset because our boy made her fall for him. They all curse him, which makes Ragna nervous, and he wants to finish this quickly and go back to his jail. Suddenly, Shin comes there to challenge him. All people cheer for him as he is also one of the chief swordsmen. He tells Ragna that he is not like other soldiers and was confident that he could defeat Ragna. But the next moment, Shin is lying on the ground, and Ragna tells him that he is indeed strong, as he didn't have time to put Silverine while fighting. He thinks that Shin is stronger than Leo. Shin tells Ragna that he doesn't need his sympathy, and runs away crying. The crowd curses him for getting defeated. The scene changes, and we see both Shin and Graham crying in a corner. Chris comes to both of them and asks them to stop crying. Shin tells him that he is not crying and asks Chris to fight Ragna. Chris tells him that he already lost to Ragna but has made his weapon even stronger. Shin asks Chris how he could be so calm when he just lost. Chris tells him that it's natural for a warrior to desire a strong weapon, right? That's the reason he got into the core, after all. He says that now he might even be able to kill a superior dragon-like butter. Shin tells him that getting stronger and holding a strong weapon is different from feeling stronger by holding a strong weapon. Chris says that he can understand why Shin is being stubborn. Ragna is so strong at such a young age, moreover, with a special power stronger than the commander. He feels the difference of being born gifted, and he says that he is also frustrated. Graham tells Chris that Ragna is not gifted, it's the exact opposite. He says that he only fought him for a moment but he is sure that Ragnar is the ungifted one who has trained his body beyond the limit of his training. That is what he felt. Chris asks if he means that Ragnar is way older than he looks. Graham says that he doesn't know about that, but what he feels is real and it made him realize that he has turned complacent in this age, and it's frustrating. Chris then asks if that's why he was so down. 
He thought it was because their commander fell head over heels for Ragna. Graham tells him that's also the reason. Shin then gets up to leave, and Chris asks where he is going. Shin says that he is bored of listening to a wimpy old man and that he will fight Ragna again. He will keep fighting him as he doesn't want to be just an accessory to a strong one on the battlefield. The scene changes, and we then see the twins asking Ragna for his name, with Shin lying beaten up near him after his seventh defeat. The twins then ask Ragna what he thinks of Lady Leah. Ragna tells them that he doesn't understand, so the twins ask whether he likes her or hates her. Ragna says neither, as he just met her. They keep insisting on asking him and tell him that the princess says that Ragna is cool. He says that he's a little bothered about that because his face is wrapped with a bandage, and she couldn't know. He says that she must have just imagined that he looks cool under all of these bandages. But actually, he's not at all. He says that once the bandage is off, he knows that she will be disappointed. The scene changes to Few, who explains what mana is. He says that it is a power that can change the world. Now, he questions what magic is. The answer is that it's the method that directs the changes caused by mana. Gathering mana by the fingertips and chanting the spell burn is one way to manifest it. There are also other ways, such as finger signs like in Naruto, which can also manifest fire. There are many methods to manifest the same change, and those who master them, among them, are the superior dragons who can manifest powerful magics. The flowing blood in their bodies itself manifests into magic. Just by imagining the change into reality, they can do powerful magic as they like. Of course, it makes them powerful. That's why thaumaturges copy the dragon's method of manifestation. The drawing that replicates the flowing blood, the magic circle, is used. Like a heart in the middle of the magic circle, veins pass through it to let mana circulate. After accumulating many years of research, they rely on the dragon's power. That is the mission of thaumaturges. After all the explanations he gave, he still fails to create a perfect teleportation circle. His team members tell him that they have made the circles for teleportation and absorption, but it won't work well because to teleport one person, they need to kill 15 lesser dragons, and they have 18 O people in the basement. They say that they won't even make it by killing all the dragons that attack them. One of the members thinks it got more complicated by setting the teleportation to human only. Other guys suggest leaving only that part out, but if they do that, even the dragons will get teleported to the destination, and then it won't be an escape. Few realizes that working overnight consecutively is messing with his subordinates' heads. They are using previous research results, which can only get them this far. Few realizes that from here on, innovation needs to be on a trial and error phase, but there is no time for that, as the dragons can arrive tomorrow. He panics and says that at this rate, before the dragon arrives, the commander will have his head first. He thinks of running away, and one of his subordinates hears it, but Few tells him he is just hallucinating. Crimson comes in and says that it's not a hallucination, though. He tells Few that he just said he'll run away. Few is shocked and asks him why he is here. Crimson says that they need him, telling them that they need him right now. He says that all of them desire novel knowledge and ideas that can get them out of this slump. The scene changes to Zora remembering the words Ultimatia said about saving him from his suffering. Zora tells that he thought, what kind of crap is this woman spouting? But that is exactly what happened. He says that the fire of hatred that scorched his body was gone. He states that he still has his memory as a human, and yet, he cannot remember the emotions attached to them. All he has is a deep love for the dragon monarch, who had taken all of his dearest possessions. He says that the most shocking thing is that he doesn't even feel any dishonor. He thought that he would remember something once he got here. He asks Terektra what he thinks. Terektra tells him that one thing doesn't change, they are still soldiers. He tells Zora that he won't let him taste another indignity for losing their master. Even if that master is the dragon monarch who killed his master when he was a human. He says that even if they have turned into dragons, this remains the same. That's their fate, their way of life. Zora and the other dragons discuss what to do next. Zora suggests two options, destroy the country and kill those who attacked Ultimatia. Volta Kamui advises ignoring Ragna and his ally, considering them prey. Zora questions if Volta Kamui plans to pursue them calling him an idiot. Volta Kamui asks why he's being called an idiot. Zora points out that the enemy exploited his absence to attack Ultimatia, emphasizing the seriousness of the situation. Ultimatia lost her time control magic, and her death would be game over for all of them. As her bodyguard, Zora insists on keeping a close watch. Kamui dismisses Zora's concerns, stating he doesn't take orders and was directed by the monarch to take the enemy's head. Ultimatia retracts her emotional order, agreeing with Zora and feeling relieved after venting. Volta Kamui comments on Ultimatia's quick emotional changes and asks about a passionate exchange on the bed. Ultimatia acknowledges losing her senses, but regaining them. 
Zora inquires about the exchanges on the bed, but Kamui refuses to divulge details. Ultimatia urges them to stop discussing it. Nebulum interjects, predicting the enemy's return without actively searching. Zora requests proof, and though Nebulum lacks concrete evidence, he sensed it during the fight. A flashback reveals their vow to kill each other, and Zora praises Nebulum's fearless demeanor. Ultimatia questions Zora about destroying the country with Kamui and Nebulum by her side. Zora reassures her and expresses the challenge of killing humans kindly. He explains the original plan to erase people in the royal capital with Nebulum's barrier, then move to another city. However, they have lost half of their forces. Ultimatia understands and instructs Zora to swiftly and securely kill everyone without leaving anyone behind. Zora suggests an easy solution, they can order the beasts. They plan to use the 40,000 lower and medial dragons they have gathered from within and beyond the country to devour everything. Zora asks Borgus to command them, and Borgus agrees. However, he should also search for Ultimatia's attackers. If they are still within the country, they might leave some clues. Kamui intervenes and asks if the Reaper is with the Argentum Corps. Zora says that if that happens, he will call him. Borgus feels relieved as the bloodline's matured dragons have halved, but they still have reliable ones. With them, they can manage to continue supporting the progenitor. Zora asks Tarek Tora about his thoughts. Tarek Tora says that they should not die. They are the bloodline's mature dragons and the progenitor's limbs. They should be of use. However, limbs are not supposed to be easily cut, yet they're down to half already. He says that they have to understand this humiliation and that one more failure is the same as total defeat. As we see Starlia using her swords to create a powerful barrier, making it difficult for dragons to move through. Isak asks her thoughts on Crimson's claim about defeating the 10th, 8th, and 3rd seats consecutively and battling the dragon monarch in the capital. He expresses doubt, and Starlia calls him stupid for believing everything Crimson said. She explains that Crimson mixes falsehood and truth, cautioning Isak not to trust him completely. Isak then asks if the superior dragons were once human. He mentions Crimson's claim that their monarch gave them blood, granting them inhuman power. Starlia confirms this, citing Ultozor and Terektra as examples they will soon face. She explains that individuals with high magical power often have non-human characteristics, more pronounced in the powerful ones. The princess notes that the highest-ordered dragons are not imitating humans but were once humans turned into dragons. Contemplating this, Isak is apprehensive about the upcoming battle. Starlia reassures him, saying it's easier to fight a different species, as humans hunt other animals for survival. She emphasizes not to worry about the information on the superior dragons being once human, as it gives more reason to eliminate them for survival. Meanwhile, Ragna wakes up from a scary dream and asks Crimson what time it is. Crimson says it's 3 a.m. on the ninth day. The two friends catch up on how things are going, with Crimson feeling proud of helping the magician fix a teleportation circle issue. Putting that aside, Crimson explains to Ragna why he advised against using Silverine battle arts. Before answering, Crimson wonders if Ragna could beat Voltakemui if they fought right now. Ragna admits it would be difficult, and Crimson is relieved that his partner has some sense. Voltakemui is a formidable superior dragon, and it's not the right time for Ragna to confront him. The reason for not using Silverine battle arts is that Ragna's enemies already know he's emitting Silvering from his body, making him easily detectable. A common superior dragon wouldn't stand a chance against him, and if they discover Ragna's location, Ulta Zoro might call Voltakamui for a swift defeat. Ragna's only option is to save as many people as he can without drawing attention to himself. Meanwhile, Isek descends a ladder and enters a corridor. He finds few acting strangely, and asks about the woman who improved the circle. Isek thinks it's good news, but few feels humiliated because Crimson proved to be more intelligent than him. The circle has improved so much that few no longer feels like it's his creation. Back in the cell, the twins return Mr. Slime, who is now shattered, to Ragna. Ragna becomes sad as Mr. Slime lost his pride as a superior life form. Crimson arrives in the cell and questions why Ragna came back. Ragna explains he can only relax in this location. Crimson confirms if Mr. Slime saved half of the silvering in his body, and instructs Ragna to infuse it into a weapon. He advises Ragna to take a sword from the princess, but to do it deep underground to avoid attention from the lineage. Before leaving, Ragna asks to talk to Mr. Slime, who is in bad shape. Crimson takes Mr. Slime in hand and hits him hard on the ground, making him forget any bad memories. Crimson tells Mr. Slime to keep an eye on Ragna until the end of the imminent battle. Next, Crimson informs Ragna that the battle will likely start around sunset, so it's crucial to prepare quickly. Before leaving, the princess appears and asks Crimson about people who were discontented but have now calmed down. Crimson claims ignorance, but Starlia wants to discuss something with Ragna alone. 
They go through a corridor, and Starlia mentions that she would prefer to create a weapon specifically for him, but time is short. Ragna will have to choose from the ones she presents. Ragna praises the sword quality, and Starlia boasts that, despite being mass-produced, she made them. Before the battle, she needs to tell him something. Meanwhile, the tutor secretly observes Starlia meeting alone with the man she likes. Starlia informs Ragna that after the battle, she plans to join the Solarians. Even if they succeed in escaping with soldiers and civilians, feeding over a thousand people in an unknown country is uncertain. Joining the Solarians as a dragon hunter is the solution, and in return, they will protect her people. Ragna asks if she knows about the Solarians, and Starlia reveals they once tried to recruit her. Unpleased, she refused. However, the situation is different now. If she dies in battle, there will be no future for her people. Starlia asks Ragna to join the Solarians in her place and lead her people and the soldiers. Although Ragna isn't obligated, Starlia pleads with him, offering to do anything in return. Ragna immediately refuses due to his dislike for the religion. Starlia insists she can't do it, leaving Ragna puzzled about why she acts as if her death is certain. Starlia explains that she lives by intuition rather than common sense. Since facing the blood of the wing, she's had a premonition of her destined death. Despite not wanting to show weakness, she believes it's natural for a commander to prepare for such situation. Changing her stance, Starlia becomes more authoritative, pointing her swords at Ragna and declaring him her subordinate in the battle. Ragnar reflects on how incredible Starlia is. In battles, he rarely thinks about dying, and when he does, he imagines it would be okay if it happened. Starlia, on the other hand, is fully prepared for the worst, making Ragnar see her as much more capable than himself. Finally, as he always wanted, he sees people like her survive in his place. In response, Ragnar uses Silvervine battle arts, putting the rest of his power into the three swords, declaring that Ulto Zora, Tarek Tora, and the dragon army will perish before his blades. Almost in tears, the princess suddenly flies away, leaving Ragna confused. The tutor asks what's happening, and the girl explains that her swords are not worthy compared to his effort. Despite the compliments, the girl feels completely humiliated. However, this only increases her determination not to give up easily and to become even stronger, forging great swords. As the dragons start to appear, the citizens of the capital wonder why the creatures are coming out of the royal palace. Soon, the attack begins, and for some reason, the soldiers remain motionless before starting to fire at the population. It turns out they are all under the control of Ulto Zora. Even the sword-wielding hunters end up being hit by the people on the ground. Red lines of energy begin to rise to the sphere of the Borgus dragon, which has already started regenerating its body. Through a vision beyond reach, the progenitor observes the entire massacre with a sad face. She recalls Borgus' request to feed on these humans, and about 500,000 would be enough. This sacrifice is for him to give his own life for the progenitor, and Nebulum would take on the role of commanding the beast, providing him with a good opportunity to gain experience. The ancient dragon knows he won't live much longer, so this is a chance to use the remainder of his life for the monarch. Moreover, after surviving the madness of the ancient monarch and the destruction of the lineage, Borgus lived with the sole desire to see the lineage restore. The progenitor fulfills this wish, and Voltakamui appears totally insensitive, supporting the old man's decision to do whatever he wants. Now, in the current moment at the base, the sun is setting, and the Silver Brigade is getting ready for the arrival of enemies. Ulto Zora speaks a few words, and tentacles emerge from the ground. The princess realizes that the barriers she placed in the earth have been broken. Despite it being a massive attack, she believes the base can withstand it. However, in the sky, Terratectra appears in its dragon form, descending. Starlia is on the verge of despair, but she remembers a tip from Crimson to counter this attack. The impact causes minimal damage, surprising Ulto Zora, who expected it to explode the cliff. Through mental communication, Terratectra states that the attack was neutralized just before the collision. Standing at the edge of the fissure formed by the collision, it's revealed that the swords emitting Silverine halted the attack. They still don't know that this is the feared Reaper. Ulto Zora considers calling Voltakamu, but Terratectra assures him that he knows his own capability and can handle Ragna. Terratectra asks for Ragna's name, and internally, the warrior reflects on being terrible at talking to people and hating to speak with dragons. As a result, the response is silence, and Terratectra decides to communicate through violence. This bring an end to our episode. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more anime recap.